Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can our co-moderator hear us, Stelios? Great. Uh, so, uh, good morning from uh, from Patras, Greece. Uh, we are hosting now, uh, we're starting now our uh, daily uh, seminar about aerosol monitoring and effects on uh, climate and uh, air quality. Uh, this is um, a five hours uh, seminar, including some uh, eminent participants, and thank you, thank you very much for their, for their participation, uh, either from here or from, uh, from Zoom. Uh, the, uh, the seminar is uh, organized by a number of, uh, let's say, um, co-organizers. First is uh, our lab and our OMC program on applied meteorology and environmental physics. This is a program that has been started uh, some years ago, aiming to provide uh, professional skills on understanding and, and mo in modeling and forecasting of the atmospheric pro uh, processes, as well as applied knowledge on weather forecast model, radiative transfer, processing and analysis of ground satellite measurements, and give to uh, the students essential tool for their uh, work later. Uh, then, uh, it's also, this, this, this seminar is also part of the uh, EO4G Alliance uh, actions. EO4G Alliance is a reference network to bridge uh, the skill and the gap between supply and demand in the area of earth observation and geographic information. It's the continuation of the EO4G project that is a part of the activities under the Copernicus uh, Academy. Stelios, would you like to share your... Uh, co-organizing uh, um, projects? Yes, the main uh, uh, organizing project for this mission is the uh, project MAP, uh, which is called Metrology of Fire for Optical Properties. And uh, uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit later about uh, what exactly it is. But more or less, it's uh, trying to gain uh, SI-based traceability uh, uh, with uh, the measurements that uh, aerosol measurements that are proceeded right now. And uh, we will hear much more uh, from Julian in, in an hour. And uh, also there is uh, this also seminar is linked with uh, the, the Cost Action Harmonia, which is, is the International Network of Harmonization and Atmospheric Aerosol Retrieval from Ground-Based Photometer. So one part of this uh, project is to do with sample photometry. So, well, uh, part of this project has to do with sample photometry, and uh, also you will hear uh, some presentations about this today. That's from my side. Great. So uh, I think it's time to start our, with our first speaker. I will uh, stop my uh, screen. Uh, Stelius, would you like to say a few words about uh, about uh, uh, our speaker? Recording in progress. I was on the Axis, which, which is the main European research infrastructure for for hazard measurement. Uh, also, he's uh, since 2014, as I said, he's the head of the Arab Physics Group. Uh, since, since 2013, he's a lecturer at ETH Zurich, uh, teaching Arizona, one and two. He has got the ERC facilitator grant, grant for uh, the project concerning black carbon in the atmosphere and mission phase in cloud interaction. And uh, since 2021, he is the coordinator of the SIS uh, Asterix Consortium and the uh, member of the Asterix European Interim Council. I will stop here because uh, it will get very long if I read everything in my so, uh, Martin, please, uh, you can start. Okay. Good morning, everyone in Patras. Good morning, everyone online. Stelios, thanks for the introduction and also thanks for giving me the opportunity to give a brief introduction and a few examples on what we do in terms of aerosol in situ measurements in European and global networks. Um, let me see.
Christy. I'll start a little bit basic. So what are atmospheric aerosols? I think you have have a fair idea if you see these pictures. These are, we speak of particles which are suspended in the air and in the direction in interaction with vapors. There's many sources, incomplete combustion, there's sea spray, wind erosion, mineral dust, volcanoes, and there's also the option that vapors are emitted like SO2 or volatile organic gases. These can react and become less volatile and condense on existing particles or form new particles. And so some of these particles are natural and some are anthropogenic, and this means there's also a human handle on, on modulating the impacts or the role of aerosol in, in atmospheric and environmental processes. And so the particles are quite small, but they are kind of in a range where they are very efficient in many in terms of many impacts and effects. And so the main reasons why we care about aerosols from an en environmental perspective are they are known to cause adverse health effects. This can be acute and it can increase mortality. I will not address this in my talk. I will have more a look on uh, their climate effects because they are known to have an impact on the Earth's radiative balance. We will look into this. Then they can also have an influence on weather variability, climate variability, and maybe extremes. That's also still a topic of current research. And then there may be feedbacks from climate change on aerosols and again on climate and weather. So in my talk, I'll try to motivate a little bit why do we do in situ observations in networks, which properties do we investigate and um, not really touching on how we measure these things, but maybe giving a short list of how we do this. So when we look at climate impacts of aerosols, I mean, I think it's well known that when looking at the effective radiative forcing in terms of walk per square meter, that greenhouse gases like CO2 and all the methane are the main positive uh, climate forces. The aerosols, which are down here in the blue box in purple colors, they are accepted to have a partially to have a cooling effect overall and so partly masking the greenhouse gas warming so far. And also what's important if you look at the error bars, they are fairly small for the greenhouse gases, but they are much bigger for the aerosols. So a main uncertainty in effective radiative forcing comes from the aerosol side. So if you want to get, for example, accurate predictions of the future, then you also need to understand the aerosols level. Um, so why is it so difficult to quantify the aerosols? There's many, many reasons, um, but one of the reasons is if you look at this image, which is kind of an artificial, artificial composite, which shows the global this snapshot of the global distribution of different aerosol components like carbonaceous aerosol, sulfate, mineral dust, sea salt, and nitrate. It, I think it's quite obvious. It's it's very heterogeneous in space, and also if I would animate, if I was animating it, it's also highly variable in time. So it needs to understand their impact. It needs the four-dimensional picture in space and time of many properties and whatever. So how, how do you get such a piece of information? This needs a combination of model simulations in which you need emissions, transport and dispersion, transformation, chemical, physical process, and of course also removal. Then you also need information from your observation networks like in situ measurements can be ground-based or airborne. The ground based part, that's where I live. Remote sensing is an important piece. You will hear about that for sure later today. Also, airborne and spaceborne. And of course, it needs process understanding, laboratory studies, theoretical understanding to complement these. And in the end, this it needs to bring the models and the observations together. So, to either but using the observation to validate the model simulation and improve them, or even to assimilate data from observa observations to get the models on the right level. 
Um, and if you see this, this high spatial heterogeneity, heterogeneity, it becomes obvious that you need to measure uh, all over the globe. And this is done in coordinated networks. So in Europe, um, when it comes to short-lived climate pollutants, where the aerosol are a part of, that there we have the ACTRIS research infrastructure, the aerosol clouds and uh, reactive trace gases, reactive research infrastructure which has observatories all over Europe in situ measurement station and remote state sending and on global scale there is for example the global atmosphere watch program of the WMO which also has sites across the globe where atmospheric composition is measured in a coordinated way and what's important is this is to ensure continuous long-term observations it's coordinated to ensure homogeneous data sets to look at trends or also to get the homogeneous picture of spatial variability. An important aspect is to collect these data and make them available in uh, central data, data centers to make them accessible and also feed them into uh, Forecast, forecast models, for example, as the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service, to have the data directly available for checking or also possibly assembling into air quality forecasts and so on. And of course, these platforms serve as a basis for research studies as well. Um, at the so we are PSI, one side where we perform such measurements for more than 20 years or even 30 years now is the Ufrayok Observatory. I'm not going into detail too much, but there is, we, we look at, at the range of properties like uh, scattering coefficient, absorption coefficient, number, number concentration, and I'm going to motivate that a little bit. So the, what are the aerosol properties we are looking at? We look at particle mass concentration. That's obviously important because many impacts just depend on the amount of aerosol you have. Then the optical properties are important for the aerosol radiation interactions, and they may also provide information on size and sources of the aerosol. Number concentration is important in certain processes. For example, when it comes to air quality, the number of insoluble particles is certainly relevant, or in climate context, aerosol cloud interruptions are often number-based processes. Then the size distribution is probably relevant for almost all processes, uh, so you need to get that right and to know it. And obviously chem chemical composition is important because it can reveal sources of the aerosol and it has influence on many physical, optical and chemical properties. Obviously, in order to cover these, if we need a wide range of measurement methods, I will not go into detail, but in the end, there is many of them are just optical methods, so using light scattering, light absorption to get information. Some are physical, balancing different forces like electrostatic force and aerodynamic drag force, and maybe an important influence in difference if we look at chemi chemical composition, there's always the option to collect on a filter and then analyze, so so-called offline analytics, or you can have online instruments like aerosol mass spectrometers where you continuously probe the aerosol directly as is. The, let us have a closer look at aerosol radiation interactions. So this is the light purple shading here, and you can see, depending on the co component, obviously some aerosol components are cool, have, can have a cooling effect and some can have a warming effect. And when it comes to cooling versus warming, then the so-called aerosol signal scattering albedo is a very important property. The signal scattering albedo compares the scattering coefficient to the total light extinction, which is the sum of scattering and absorption coefficient. So if we have a non-absorbing aerosol only scattering light, it will have a SSA of one. If we have a strongly light absorbing aerosol, which also scatters light, the SSA can be 
0.2, 0.5, if it's black carbon, so the most strongly light absorbing aerosol. This will obviously make a difference for aerosol radiation interactions. Up here, I just have a kind of a simplified uh, radiative transfer equation, which uh, looks at the change in the incoming, so incoming solar flux as a function of the range of aerosol properties and surface albedo fraction of cloud cover. And I think what's what's important, I mean, there's there's a part where the aerosol shows up, and the three basic aerosol properties we need to know is kind of the darkness, the single scattering albedo of the aerosol. Then we need to know the directional dependence, whether the light is scattered in forward or, or downward or upward direction can obviously play a role. And we need to know the columnar, columnar aerosol load, which is uh, the aerosol optical depth. And so in this part of the equation, this is the part which determines the sign of the radiative forcing. There's the surface albedo is there, single scattering albedo and also the um, upscatter fraction. So that means you can put this in a graph with single scattering albedo on one axis, surface reflectance on the other axis, and then you get lines for different upscatter fraction. And in the end, if the aerosol has an omega, a single scattering albedo above the line, then it will have a cooling effect. If it has a single scattering albedo below the line, then it will have a warming effect. So to get the single scattering albedo right, you need to know light scattering and you need to know light absorption. When it comes to light scattering, it's actually, there's a peculiar, peculiarity about aerosol. When I, what I show here is the mass specific scattering efficiency. So that's the scattering coefficient per mass of aerosol, which translates to um, square meters per gram, so the, or the scattering cross-section per gram of aerosol. And if you look at this figure, if small particles are very inefficient, large particles are very inefficient, but if you are in the me optics range, and that's actually where a lot of the volume of the aerosol sits, then they are extremely efficient in scattering the light. So if you want to interact with solar radiation, you have to get your material to the size of exactly the size that aerosols typically have. And I'm not going to say more about light scattering, but the key point is if you want to get light scattering right for the aerosol, of course, you need to know refractive index and shape maybe a little bit, but the key point is you need to get the size distribution of the aerosol right if you want to get light scattering. When we look at light absorption, and there I'm going to have a closer look, there's black carbon is the strongest light absorber and also quite abundant. So this is the dominant contributor to total absorption aerosol optical depth on a global scale um, here in a st study from Sunset at Dow. Then mineral dust is an important absorber because it can be uh, open important contributor because it can be present in large amounts and then also light absorbing organics can make a contribution as well. And obviously black carbon is mostly anthropogenic, thus mostly, mostly natural and brown carbon can be both of it. An interesting feature what we also need to know is obviously the light absorption across the solar spectrum and in a study by Kirstetter et al, the thing they found is if, if you have traffic emissions, which is kind of pure, more or less pure elemental carbon, if you have an efficient engine, then you have a flat spectral dependence. For fire smoke, open wood burning, you tend to get the high spectral dependence. So there's a difference. And that's because um, in from engines, you get tend to get black smoke. From fires, you can get the mixture of organics and black carbon, so which tends to get you something brownish. And the spectral dependence can often be approximated by a power law with the absorption angstrom exponent as the power law exponent. And so this power law exponent can give you 
information on the source of the light absorbing aerosol in the end. Because for wood combustion, you have co-emit brown cone, gives you high AAE, um, diesel engines, pure black cone, the low AAE. So if you measure the spectral dependence, absorption exponent, if you find the low value, then you know it's um, probably black carbon from traffic. If you get the high value, then it's probably black carbon from wood burning, and in between, it's, it's a blend of the two. Of course, this doesn't always work, it's, but it can work surprisingly well. And what's, what's the value of this, for example? Um, one thing you can do is in the Within Actress, we do such measurements of the spectral dependence across Europe in the network. So you can these data and you get the information, you get the AAE and you can use that to split the black carbon contribution to combustion engines and uh, wood burning. You get the, the two mass concentrations. And on the other side, there's, for example, the comes. Um, Europe-wide Europe, operation, Europe, Europe-wide air quality service, which makes a forecast of air quality and also of, of different contributors like elemental carbon from fossil fuel and elemental carbon from wood burning. And of course, if you have such products in the model, it's also important to validate because you have emissions, transport, whatever you have uncertainties in the model. So if you have a distributed network, then you can validate your model your model against the observation. And if you have just one site, and if you improve your model at this site, you don't know whether it's going to be worse at other locations. But if you um, if you have many sites, then, then you get much better constraints on the quality of your model. Now I'll switch to uh, so cloud interactions, that's the, in the radiative forcing part, that's the dark purple thing, and here you see this is overall accepted to have a cooling effects, so the dominant cooling con contribution of aerosols to cooling. If we look, if you look at cloud formation, cloud formation in the end, you need humidity, and you have a cooling, uh, that's one way, so updraft, Cooling increases relative humidity, and at one point you exceed 100%, and then the equilibrium tells you any, any water present above 100% relative humidity should be liquid water. But here where 100% is reached, that's where the music starts to play, because in the end, forming a new phase um, doesn't just happen easily, because forming small particles is, has associated with an energy barrier, so instead of homogeneous nucleation, which would happen at more than 200% relative humidity, there is heterogeneous nucleation on pre-existing aerosol particles acting as cloud condensation nuclei. So this means the amount of liquid water is given by thermodynamics, but the number of droplets depends on the pre-existing aerosol particle number. And an important aspect is if you compare um, in 1974, the so-called Toomey effect was reported. So this figure shows a relationship between cloud albedo and cloud optical thickness. And the cloud optical thick thickness is if you fix it, fix the liquid water content is just proportional to the mass, mass specific scattering cross section. And you remember this figure from before here, it's for water, the mass specific scattering cross section as a function of diameter for water. And if you are in clouds, we are in the geometric regime where it's proportional to one over diameter. So if you have bigger droplets, you have a lower mass scattering cross section. And again, for a fixed liquid water content, obviously the droplet diameter is inversely proportional to droplet number. So this, if you take this together, if you have more CCN, you, can, you will have smaller droplets, larger mass scattering coefficient, larger cloud optical thickness, and a higher cloud albedo. That's in the end how aerosol particles can modulate cloud, cloud optical thickness. And this can, of course, also have impacts on uh, precipitation and lifetime of clouds. The, if we have a quick look at the theory of 
um, activation, heterogeneous nucleation of cloud droplets and aerosol particles. So what we need is Kohler theory. There's two effects in it. One is the Kelvin effect, the vapor pressure enhancement over a curved surface, which is associated with the surface energy, uh, interfacial energy, and there's Ralph's law. So if you dilute something, you decrease the chemical potential, and combined, you get the Kohler curve. If the Kohler curve, as a function of droplet diameter relative and relative humidity as a function of droplet diameter, it always has a maximum which is slightly above 100%. But we only speak about uh, 0.1% to 1% for typical aerosol particle sizes. So, and if ambient supersaturation exceeds this value, then an aerosol particle can act as cloud condensation nuclei and form a droplet. And what do we need to know whether a particle acts as a cloud um, CCN or can act as a CCN? One aspect is diameter in the figure here. For a fixed composition, if we have small particles, we need a high supersaturation to activate them as CCN. If we have a bigger diameter, it only needs a small supersaturation. So obviously size is one important aspect. Big particles are good CCN, small particles are poor CCN. And then we need to know the composition here on the right. It's for a fixed diameter. If we have soluble inorganics, then it needs only low supersaturation. Oxidized organics, which are slightly hygroscopic, need it somewhat higher supersaturation. And insoluble material needs much higher supersaturation. So we need to know composition and um, diameter. And one thing we did is based on observations of size distribution, composition, and cloud condensation number uh, concentrations were made at several sites in Europe, and also some outside Europe, so with multi-year data sets, we collected them together, and then modelers, they ran a bunch, some 15 or so global climate models and predict, and looked at their for the CCN number they had, they predict in their model or they simulate in their model. And if you compare this here for the Jungfrau Jocht, it's a systematic bias, higher CCN measured than predicted. And that's actually, I'm just showing for Jungfrau Jocht, but it was quite consistent across the sites. What was also done is looking at composition. So the question is then where does this bias, systematic bias in CCN come from? Looking at composition in some of the models, the, the sulfate generally worked well for all of the models. For the organics, the um, Jungfrau-Jock was also typical that the model underpredicted the organics than the compared to the measurements. So the models had too low particle number, they had too low organics, so one potential reason for the bias in CCN was maybe a bias in organics, and then more analysis was done, though obviously also hygroscopicity of the materials plays a role or whatever. But the important point is, I want to say is, if you have distributed measurements, um, then you get the much more consistent picture and the much, much better constraints, constraints on your model's simulations, whether they are doing well or whether they are, whether there is some systematics in bias, and you can find out where you may have to improve your simulations. And I think this already gets me to the end. Um, the, I think a simple summary is quantitative understanding of aerosol environmental impacts will remain an important challenge for many years to come. And I think there's also many important questions that remain to be answered. One current topic we are looking at, at PSI is in situ aerosol polarimetry. In the end, if you have an aerosol and shine light on it, it will scatter light in all directions. Looking at this light gives you a lot of information about the aerosol properties, so you can uh, retrieve aerosol properties, and which is a, a major, major approach in remote sensing, obviously, to get aerosol information. I don't have time to go into this, but if anyone is interested, there's now a registration open for a, a aerosol training course in Granada in June this year, so if that's a topic you're interested in, then feel free to apply for that one. Thanks for your attention.
Thanks a lot. Thanks, Martin. Uh, just, just a second to, to, to close the mic in here. In the end, if you if you have small particles, then I'm not sure whether later today you, you will hear. But if you have small particles, if you're in the Rayleigh regime, then you will have symmetric forward back backward scattering. And if you have big particles, then you tend to have more forward scattering, which is here on the left, and less backward scattering. So the the P F11 is just the the di direction of total scattering for unpolarized incoming light. Um, so that's one thing how you get the information of size. And But then the polarization is also related to size and related to refractive index. And so maybe some important aspect is also if we, um, I mean, a challenge or a challenge or the light absorbing part, it is trying to measure light absorption with um, through scattering only, and if, if you have a simple error, like a unimodal spherical error, so if you measure phase function and polarization, then dependence, you get the size out, you get the volume out, you get the refractive index out, but the challenge in the atmosphere is that in the end, the aerosol is so complex, a mixture um, of different sizes, different composition, and, and non-spherical particles like dust or soot, and then your aerosol model is simpler than the, the reality and you be, end up with an ill post problem and so you have to make assumptions on on your aerosol model and which you have to uh, assume a, sh a certain shape or mixing state and, and that's a place where we want to work with in situ measurements we can have controlled experiments where we know all these properties independently we can measure the phase function and then we can see wh where there might be room to improve the retrieval performance because if if you do atmospheric remote sensing then you, of course you can also measure these properties and infer infer that the uh, polarization dependence and size dependence and infer aerosol properties, but then you often don't have reference data to validate or to to determine what's the best retrieval approach. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I don't know, Andreas, if you have any questions from the auditorium? Uh, not, not more. <laughs> I, I, I was about to ask about this uh, new hot topic on, uh, on the polarizing aerosol. Also the, the effect on, uh, Etc. However, I think it we are running out of time. So, Martin, thank you so much for uh, for your participation. And uh, just before um, continuing to our next speaker, uh, just uh, let me say that uh, uh, just let me uh, share my, my screen and uh, check a little bit the the program. Uh, actually, we are running from uh, uh, from 10 to 2 o'clock uh, Central European time. One more uh, hour should be added for, for the Greek local time. And we will have a break around uh, 11.30. Uh, so after our, our uh, first piece of Martin, our next speaker is uh, Vasily Samiridis from the National Observatory of Athens, uh, expert on aerosol profiling using LiDAR sensors. Uh, Stelios. Would you like to say a few more words about uh, Vasilis? And Vasilis, please share your presentation as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Vasilis, for speaking uh, in this session. Vasilis is the research director at the National Observatory of Athens, Greece. 
Uh, in the science, the atmospheric science is focusing on the impact of short term climate forces on radiation in extreme weather. His research is mainly based on advanced ground based and spatial remote sensing, passive and active techniques, and theoretical models. Uh, he's an active member of FACTRIS, and also he has received the European Research Council ERC grant on uh, related with uh, dust areas. Vasilis, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Steyos, thank you, Andreas, for the invitation. Uh, today, I have been asked to give a presentation on LIDARs and their applications for atmospheric results. I will try to summarize some uh, uh, research that we are doing here at the National Observatory of Athens using LIDARs from ground, but also from space. And these are new missions that I will try to give some focus since we have young ones here today. So they will hear some more about new technologies that are being uh, implemented for uh, areas of research. Uh, I would like also to thank Martin for this nice introduction on the physics of the arrows of physics and chemistry and how these particles interact with radiation and uh, clouds for cloud formation. So I, I won't have to do that again. I removed some uh, slides. So I'm going directly forward to describe to you what is it, it is a LIDAR, what is the principle and what techniques we are using from physics in order to detect aerosol particles in the atmosphere. First of all, I would like to say that there is a big difference that we, with Martin and all this active component for in situ, we are measuring in situ, right? So here with lidars and photometers, we are measuring the atmospheric cold. So in that, uh, in that case of the lidars, we are retrieving vertical profile, which is very important for the radiative transfer calculation in ambient conditions. So this is a laser from the PolyXT LiDAR. We are running a similar system at the Adikithera Island for Pagea. This is the laser beam. And you see here uh, a, a, some particles and molecules that are there in the atmosphere at, this, at distances from the LiDAR. And this is the detector, a telescope that we operate. And these are the pulses that we emit with the LiDAR. So these pulsed lasers can emit uh, at three harmonics, at 1064 nanometers, 532 nanometers, and 335 nanometers, and we get back the light. And knowing the speed of light, we can calculate the range. So this is range result measurements. What we get back, we get the backscatter from the molecules and the particles. And this information is hidden in the signal that we detect in the detector. So this signal actually is a uh, uh, analogous to, to the backscatter coefficient from the atmospheric particles and molecules and also to the attenuation, so the extinction coefficient. This is an example of what we get in the atmosphere. This is the time and here is the height from 0 to 14 kilometers. These are some cirrus clouds. We have the background noise here from the LiDAR, the clouds and the aerosols that confine mainly in the PBL. And this is a profile you get if you average all these signals and you make the retrieval also by solving this equation here. So, in brief, lidars emit past light. The light is scattered and absorbed by molecules and particles. Uh, the sum of the absorption and the scattering is the extinction coefficient. Then the received backscatter signal depends on atmospheric backscatter and extinction coefficient. This is the so-called backscatter LiDAR. We have these laser pulses that are emitted, then we have the attenuation with range, then we have the backscatter to the receiver, and we end up with a LiDAR equation, which is this one, and it has the, the known problem that it is one equation with two unknowns, backscatter and extinction. And so what we do in order to solve this problem, we assume a LiDAR receiver. The LiDAR ratio is actually the ratio between the extinction and the backscatter. Assuming that we can solve and retrieve the equation and retrieve a backscatter coefficient. So here is the example I showed you before with the final profile in the atmosphere, okay? However, the problem with the LiDAR ratio is that different scatterers have different LiDAR ratio and we need to know the scatter type before solving the equation. For example, for clouds, we have LiDAR ratio of 20 theragians here. While for the PBL here, for polluted continental aerosols, we have a LiDAR ratio of 60 theragians. So in that sense, when we multiply here with the LiDAR ratio to get the extinction coefficient, 
because this is more important parameter than the backscatter for radiative transfer calculations, then we get three times uh, the concentrated the, the extinction that we were expecting to have if we assume a constant LIDAR ratio to solve the LIDAR equation. So this is a clever way that we discovered on how to cope with that problem, is to detect also with the LIDARs the molecular backscatter signal. This is done today with two methods, the Raman method and the high spectral resolution LIDARs that are trying to separate the total signal that we receive in the telescope to the aerosol and the molecular return. This is based actually, we call it as inelastic scattering because in the case of the Raman scattering, it's not like backscatter, we gave all the scattered photons with the same energy back as with the one that we emitted. But in the Raman case, you know well from physics that the molecule, the, because we target molecules in the atmosphere in that case, uh, absorb the energy and scatter photon back with less energy, so with a higher wavelength. And this is the spectra we get for the Raman lines if uh, we uh, assume the emission wavelength of 355 nanometer for the LIDARs. So we get vibrational and rotational Raman returns from oxygen and nitrogen, and we get a nice signal also from the water vapor, which is used for water vapor profiling with LIDARs. In our case, we detect the rotational Raman from the, from the nitrogen at 387, while we at 355. And what we get at the end from a combined backscatter Raman LiDAR, we get an elastic backscatter signal, an inelastic Raman backscatter signal, one equation, the one that we discussed before for backscatter and extinction, one equation for the LiDAR, uh, the Raman LiDAR inelastic signal. But the case with this equation is that we know the backscatter from molecules, right? So we can directly calculate the extinction. So from a Rama LiDAR, we have the extinction, then we solve the second equation for the backscatter, and we get everything. A profile of extinction, a profile of backscatter in the atmosphere. And if you remember this spectra, we can also get the water vapor profile. And what else? We can also detect the polarization. If we, some, if we emit a linear polarized light, then by deploying two polarizers, in, uh, in the receptor, we can get uh, polarization signals. And this is very critical, why? Because having a particle depolarization ratio uh, profile, we can characterize the non-spherical aerosols, which are mainly the natural aerosols that Martin mentioned before. Uh, human uh, emitted aerosols from human activities are actually mostly uh, spherical, while desert dust or uh, small particles we find uh, that they they have uh, non-spherical shapes and thus uh, they deliver a depolarization ratio uh, of the order of 30% in most of the cases. Having all these capabilities in one system, like the PolyXT that we implemented in Adikithera, then you can get plenty of products here for three wavelengths, 355, 532, and 1064, we can detect three backscatter coefficients at 532, 335, and 1064, two extinction coefficients from the Raman channels at 387 and 607, two depolarization ratios by detecting cross and copolar channels at 532 and 365, and water vapor profiles. So this is a very powerful system capable of producing all these optical properties. And we, this is an example from uh, Antikythera from the Kapagia Observatory. You see here uh, three profiles for the backscatter, two for extinction, and axtrem exponent, which is actually an intensive property that can provide information on the size of the particle for different heights, you see here. And the linear particle depolarization ratio, in this case, it tells us that this layer is actually transported from the Saharan Desert. So it's a Saharan dust layer located here over the Antikythera. Then we can use the garlic or the grasp, the so-called grasp algorithm. I'm sure that Oleg will let you know more information about that in the following uh, per his presentation. But this is a combination we use together with uh, Anton, Oleg, and Alexandra in order to retrieve from the combination of the LiDAR and the photometer 
size distributions, but also vertical profiles of the single scattering albedo, which is very critical, as Martin already mentioned, for radiative transfer calculation. Having all this wealth of information from the LIDARs, one can actually uh, run some back trajectories and run some source apportionment studies in order to classify these measurements according to the hours of time. Different hours of types have different properties, right? So if we classify all these measurements with mineral, uh, depending on the hours of type, then we have a characterization. And this is actually something that we wait also from theory, because the LIDAR ratio is, uh, is smaller for particles like the sea salt particles and larger for more absorbing particles like the soot. The depolarization ratio is straightforward, dependent on the non-spherical uh, shape of the particles, while the axon exponent, as I already mentioned, can give you an indication of the aerosol size. And while we have solved most of these uh, calculations for spherical particles with me theory and the ray light regime, as already mentioned before, we, can, we can still have some, uh, some uh, work to do when it comes to the non-spherical particles. We have several models. Oleg from 2006 has already introduced the proate and oblate spheroids. And then uh, recent models have also implemented ellipsoids, and we also have irregular hexahedrons uh, recently in the TAMU database in order to solve the forward problem from the physical properties and the assumptions of the particle state, how that we get radiative and optical properties over it, right? But these calculations have to be expanded for, for superconscious particles. This is something that we recently discovered. Uh, from campaigns in the Atlantic and airborne in situ measurements that actually the size distribution of the particles, especially for dust, is extended on the super coarse mode. This is what we know and this is what we actually have in our models up to date. But the, there are very large particles in the atmosphere that are managed to transport it, to be transported in larger distances than expected. And this has actually an impact also on the radiation uh, calculations, and this has been nicely demonstrated in the paper of Claire Ryder in 2019. In any case, these measurements that we are measuring with light lidars are ambient measurements that can be used for radiative transfer calculations. They are not restricted in size, they are not theoretical ones, so if we group them in the framework of axis. We have several stations here, lidars in, uh, in Europe with Elinet, and we have other lidars that are deployed in uh, regions of the world, such as uh, Cabo Verde, we have in, uh, in uh, South America, Tropos, and the PolyXT network has done a lot of work on that. And if we gather all these measurements together and cluster and classify them per aerosol type, then we see that they can be clustered according to the LIDAR ratio and the particle linear depolarization ratio, at least as it comes to the size and the sphericity. So using all these measurements, we can run studies for the quantification of the direct aerosol radiative effect, the separation between the natural and anthropogenic effect, the atmospheric model evaluation, satellite product validation and enhancement, and also using uh, this information for, for data simulation within models. And I will give you in this second part of my presentation some examples on how we exploit these capabilities also using the satellite drivers. So starting with Calypso, this is the Calypso mission flying from 2006. This is a very successful mission by NASA. It is a backscatter lighter at 532 and 1064, deploying also a depolarization channel. You see here the attenuated backscatter, then the depolarization ratio showing nicely here the cirrus clouds, some dust encounters in at the five kilometer level here, and then some nice uh, work that has been done by Calypso team in order to get the aerosol type on the table, and this is dust with yellow, and you see the different types. Now, as you already know by now from this presentation, the backscatter lighters need a lighter ratio assumption in order to deliver the extinction, right? So we have only backscatter here, and in order to get extinction, 
this is what we get from Actress, and recently Athena Flutzi had a very nice paper summarizing the results, providing to Calypso for the different nozzle types, typical LIDAR ratios in order to retrieve the extinction, to have global views of the extinction profiling towards better radiative transfer calculations and constraining uh, radiation calculations globally. However, you see here that there are differences, and this is something that comes from actress towards NASA in order to correct some algorithms and retrieve better results when it comes to dust. You have large LIDAR ratios for the Saharan dust and lower for Asian and Arabian Middle East dust. We have developed in actress several methodologies and we tested them in, uh, from our ground-based LiDAR systems, how, this is a paper by Albert and Rodanti Manmuri did a lot of work on that, to deliver, uh, to separate dust from the total aerosol in external mixtures, so using the depolarization information. So, using the signal that the aerosol gives us in the optical measurements from their non sphericity So, this property is used to separate them from the total aerosol alone to, to create a mixing ratio, let's say, of dust, right? And we have uh, validated these calculations against in situ measurements, filter measurements with a Falcon aircraft of DLR here. You see how well uh, this is what Calypso gives us, and this is what we get from the mixture and how we separate dust from the total aerosol loads. Now, in NOAA, we, we worked a lot with Calypso in order to deliver a dust product from Calypso and to be used for studies, uh, global studies of desert dust load and distribution, and also trends. And this is the so-called LIMAS data set that have been uh, produced here at NOAA, and there are a lot of, work, of papers on that. And you see how well we first uh, discriminate desert dust from the total aerosol, and then we deliver an extinction using typical LIDAR ratios from uh, the ground-based measurements we have from ACTIS, the climatologist. And this is an example how we can use Calypso to deliver uh, desert dust loads that have been separated from the total load you see here. You see how well the smoke from uh, in Africa has been uh, actually excluded while the anthropogenic pollution in China as well or in Europe. So this is actually located within the dust bowl and the outflow regions, as you see, uh, that has been received by Manolis in this case. And then Manolis Perestakis has also used these data sets uh, in order to calculate fluxes and uh, then calculate the mass loss in between consecutive cells in the Calypso climatologies. And with that, if you do that, you can actually uh, end up with the position estimations. That's the position. And this is something that we developed within the domo CISA study, a project that aims to, to deliver the position fields, that is position validated against the position measurements at the ocean with the NEOs, a buoys you see here. And this is a work that we conclude soon to deliver these nice data sets. And finally, Adonis Gikas did a lot of work to, to combine LIVAS along with MODIS to get more uh, data sets over, uh, over uh, a globe. It's called MIDAS. This is another database that has been used also from uh, Lobotet Sedal, uh, a student in Patras that successfully delivered a very nice study here uh, using MIDAS to calculate trends of desert dust over different regions. Closing with Calypso, let's go to a more a modern one, a LiDAR. This is a high spectral resolution LiDAR. It's called EOLUS. It's a European mission by the European Space Agency. This LiDAR can deliver aerosol and cloud profiles, but also wind profiles. How they do that with the Doppler? They, they, they take advantage of the Doppler effect. They measure at closer wavelengths in order to find the shift, and from that they calculate uh, the wind profiles. And this is a very nice experiment we implemented. NOAA has actually coordinated the ground-based activities in Cabo Verde, where, where we tried to use ground, airborne, and satellite synergies in order to deliver a, a calval and also exploitation of the data sets of errors for different applications. 
This is what we deployed at Cabo Verde. It's a cloud radar, a polyxy lidar, not the one I showed you before, a wind lidar, a microwave radiometer, and a disdrometer. And these are two new lidars that we developed at NOAA along in collaboration with the three company metrics who del delivered the Wally LiDAR system. This is a special system, uh, a polarization one at 64 aiming to measure circular, elliptical, or linear depolarization together to, to, to bring more information on the non sphericity of the particles and their orientation. While EAM is a system that has been developed specifically for the calibration and validation of the EU satellite. This is the reference system for satellite. These are the retrievals from the 24-7 system, the PolyXT, for the month of uh, September of 2021. This is the whole month. So you see here the arrows of loads up to five kilometers. We have some overpasses with aircraft. We have the depolarization ratios here. So the Saharan Airlines is located between one and five kilometers. You see three events recorded. The polarization shows exactly where these arrows are confined. While here, you see no depolarization, of course, from the marine sea salt particles that are located, and also from the volcanic arrows that we have detected from the eruption of uh, La Palma in, uh, in uh, the Canary End that has been advected over Cabo Verde at that time. So here are the first comparisons with uh, Eve. Actually, we shifted the satellite over the location of the ASCOS experiment in uh, Cabo Verde in order to have uh, co-located measurements to validate the mission. And these are the first results we get. The particle backscatter, the extinction coefficient, and the LiDAR ratio. We see a nice performance for backscatter slightly underestimated values for desert dust, we see that the extinction is very noisy for errors and corresponding with the LiDAR ratio have some uh, discrepancies. And here is where we discovered that actually errors has a problem with desert dust because cannot detect the cross-polar channel. Uh, so ESA implemented the mission targeting specifically the winds. But for ARZOs, when the ARZOs are non spherical, then we have an underestimation because we do not detect the cross channel. And this is something that we will correct in the future EOLUS missions that are scheduled already. And this is the underestimation demonstrated also by the study of Antonis in Antikythera, where we gathered all the Pangaea measurements to, to assess this underestimation. And this is what we get if we try to assimilate the ARZO project. In, uh, this is the ECWF's model. We are trying to see how the ARZO impact the numerical weather prediction. We know very well from the study of uh, Michael Rene here that when we assimilate Eolus in the winds, we have an impact. But when we assimilate dust uh, and ARZOs in general, we see that we have an impact as well. And this is the impact on the winds. It's up to two meters per second, where especially when it comes uh, uh, near the Arzo, uh, the region such as the south, as we have here. And this is actually the impact of dust on the winds when we have, here is the difference between assimilated minus uh, control runs from ECMWF model. So the wind, on the other hand, the wind profile from the LiDAR of Eros was very uh, accurate according to the validation study of Polgar for Cabo Verde. Here are some balloons that we launched with Joanna in this case. And here is the result from Mike I told you already, where we see that the wind of arrows and the assimilation gives us a very a, a large improvement in the FSOI. The FSOI is uh, the, the metric that we use in numerical weather prediction to show how well uh, a model uh, performs. And this is the difference in performance, actually, which is uh, the standard deviation, the difference between the assimilated minus the non-assimilated. And we see that the standard deviation up to two meters per second, especially over the tropics, where we miss uh, also measurements. And the measurements, how well the measurements uh, and the radiations constrain the numerical weather prediction is only here in the COVID period. When the aircraft stopped flying, and these are uh, observations as well, meteorological observations for assimilation, and you see here 
how the FSOI impact decreased, while ELUS in the same period increased in terms of impact because it was the only instrument providing information over, for example, the Atlantic, right? And this is a study, again, called Newton that uh, has been run by Adonis. You see here how the winds affect also the emission, right? The wind is a driver for emitting dust particles from the deserts, and these are the differences, how Eolus helps. And this is the last example I will show you to close the presentation. I hope we have the time. Andreas, five more minutes. Three more minutes. Three more minutes. One more minutes. From the bottom, because they have these infrared cameras and they calculate telescopically here the plume height, but also an emission estimation that is given in these uh, in these messages. And we also use synergies from satellites. You see here how the data eruption of the March 2021 and how this plume captured well captured by Severi dispersed over uh, the Aegean and even uh, reached Limassol, but for sure it reached Adikithia here. And our system is what, this is what the system delivered using standard meteorology, which shows that actually the plume does not cross Adikithia, right? This is the recording in Adikithia by our LiDAR. So our LiDAR shows that there should be a, a high concentration of aerosol layer between eight and 12 kilometers. This is very critical information for aviation, right? But the model provides nothing. So what we did was to use the Eolus simulator tool. And this is the green one. So the green one, more accurate in terms of advection. And we see that actually captures the impact in Adikithira. And this is the impact in Adikithira, the vertical profile of, of uh, the volcanic ash. And this is the, the model output, which is very successful. So these results showed us, if we translate it for aviation, we gathered all the flights around the region, and we see that actually, without the use, eight flights may have been exposed to the volcanic ash without knowing. And this is very critical result, along with all the other results we get from EOS in terms of NWP, but also for Argo transport, and this is why ESA scheduled two more uh, EOS missions along with UNITSAT for future operational use. We will have 10 years covered by EOS in the future. And of course, we anticipate also the next generation of LiDAR that will be launched uh, by ESA the Earthcare. This is a, a super system that we expect to have a super mission along with uh, LiDAR, cloud radar, photometry. Uh, multi-spectral imagers, everything will be on board in order to constrain our cloud interactions and all the other atmospheric challenges we have to solve in the future. So stay tuned and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, lot Lucy. Uh, uh, I was saving a lot of, of questions, questions about, about Eolus, uh, or Eolus and uh, Capo Verde, but uh, actually you, you answered that at the end. Uh, uh, but I would like to, to just to add one more question, since you don't have anything from, from the auditorium. Uh, what about all the synergies of such measurements from satellites or even uh, ground uh, with uh, cloud condensation nuclei and the effect of climate? I mean, the, the discussion, the, it will be discussed later, so if you ha would like to have a comment on this. What are the future of this?
a lot of work on uh, having a, an arousal model from remote sensing in terms of size distribution and typical uh, properties for different types. And when you do that, then you can actually calculate from the LiDAR returns uh, CCN and ice nucleic particle concentrations. This is a work that has been published by Albert and, uh, and uh, Martin Cyprus and Lenny Marino did a lot to validate these results against uh, drone measurements, in situ measurements of ice nuclear particle concentrations. And these profiling, I didn't include the results of ground data. We have some preliminary results from Calypso, and we aim to apply that also in air care in the future. What we do is to calculate all these concentrations for INT and CCN, and then try to have comparisons with ice crystal uh, concentration information that we get, for example, from uh, the cloud radar over Earthcare. And this will be very, very useful. We have plans to assimilate aerosol LiDAR uh, profiles along with cloud radar uh, profiles to have assimilated fields within one model, in ECMWF, and then try to get uh, aerosol cloud interaction uh, parameterizations from these ambient uh, measurements and uh, synergies with models. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Simis. Simis. and thank uh, you for, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, so, our next speaker is uh, our co-host, Stelios Kazatzis from PMOD WRC. Uh, Stelios, would like to introduce yourself and please upload your presentation. Uh, yes, uh, yes, you can see. You see. Uh, it's uh, not it's full not screen, full. but uh, okay, now okay, it's fine. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Andreas. I'm Stelis Kazatzis. Uh, I work in the Physics and Neurology Observatory of Tarbox, the World Radiation Center. Uh, I've been working with uh, solar radiation and also some photometric aerosol measurements from my PhD till uh, now. And uh, I've been working to the Soviet University of Thessaloniki, the Physics and Neurology Spag Institute, the National Observatory of Athens, and for the past eight years, I'm in uh, the Polaradiation Center, where I lead this uh, World Optical Depth Research and Calibration Center. Uh, I will start my presentation about uh, things uh, we think that also Martin mentioned, but uh, for some photometry, things are a bit different because we are talking about the columnar properties of aerosol, and we're interested for the columnar properties because uh, we're interested on the Earth uh, <coughs> atmosphere balance or imbalance and all the atmospheric constituents that have an impact on this uh, imbalance. And uh, one of the anthropogenic, let's say, very important uh, parameters are aerosols, together, of course, with the greenhouse gases and also land use changes. And aerosols affect uh, the short wave radiation, also the longer radiation, with uh, yellow and uh, orange, as yes, you can see in the figure. And uh, with different ways, uh, in the columnar sense, with mostly with attenuation, but this attenuation is uh, scattering, but also can be absorption, and uh, also with uh, interaction with clouds, as uh, Martin has explained very, uh, in, in very detail. So, also Martin described that aerosols in the atmosphere play an important role in this imbalance because uh, they mostly cool the atmosphere, so they are masking somehow the effects of greenhouse gases, but still uh, the uncertainty is quite high, and uh, we need to, to work on that. From the perspective of some photometry, uh, we uh, were dealing with uh, I'm going to speak mostly about sample photometers uh, on the ground, ground-based sample photometers. And uh, basically, there are two different kinds of measurements. One is the measurement of the direction, so the attenuation of uh, the aerosols is measured compared with what uh, we have in the top of the atmosphere. And then there are measurements on the sky radiance or uh, or solar radiance, or so sky radiance, that uh, using this measurement, someone can derive other aerosol properties that uh, are obtained using some inversion modeling. Uh, now, starting with the most important parameter, uh, is the aerosol optical depth. 
Este în este momentul pe Amandu, Cardo, prezent în Vie Atmosfer, este Unitless Variable and it's a measure of the extinction of the light that passes through an outer layer or in the atmosphere, from the top of the atmosphere to our sensor, to the ground. So this attenuation is described by the Beer Lambert law, uh, where uh, we have an, our measurement eye and uh, we have also uh, our uh, um, Okay. And we have also the, the archaeological depth is described here as B. Uh, so there are different attenuators in the atmosphere that, that can be molecular scattering, that can be the aerosol, that can be other graphic. And we need to understand the, also these absorbers in order to derive the aerosol depth. Of course, this uh, parameter is uh, wavelength dependence, and here you can see the optical depth. So the optical depth of different parameters uh, in the atmosphere, including the aerosols, as a spectral uh, uh, function measured by spectral radiometers, and also with uh, this green and uh, blue uh, dots that are measurement from filter radiometers that are measuring only they're measuring aerosol, aerosol optical depth. You can see that the choice of these uh, of these dots are in places that uh, there are no significant absorption for other trace gas in the atmosphere. However, you can see that uh, in this uh, from 300 up to 2,000 nanometers, there are a lot of uh, absorbers in the in the atmosphere. Now, uh, when we measure the with the sample photometer the attenuation, we're actually measuring some signal, which can be volts or amperes. And then we need some kind of procedure, including the to have the calibration of the instrument, to implement the calibration, some post processing algorithms for this atmospheric input, and also to have a knowledge about if the clouds are present or not, in order to, to have a valid uh, let's say measurement. Otherwise, if the clouds are just in front of the sun, then it's uh, not possible to, to measure accurately the attenuation of aerosol. And uh, in the end, we have a unitless uh, spectral product which is called aerosol optical depth. Uh, <coughs> this is only equation I have in, in my presentation, but it's more or less this very Lambert law that we saw in the previous slide. And uh, they have different, uh, in the beginning it's I, it's the, the measurement at the ground, I0 is the R calibration, and then all the other parameters are different uh, attenuators. And uh, you can see that when calculating the aerosol optical depth, in addition to I, which is our measurement, we need this I0, which is the calibration of the instrument. We need uh, a function of, uh, of other algorithms that calculate, the, for example, the molecular scattering, which is a function of wavelength. We need uh, uh, other parameters that we have to measure at this particular moment, which is the pressure. It's the Ozone, ozone total volume ozone and also NO2 in some cases. And all these M's are the air masses that uh, we need in order to have uh, the aerosol optical depth described in a columnar uh, sense. Uh, now, about the calibration, I will not talk so much, but uh, the more uh, let's say traditional way is the Langley technique. It's uh, what you see here, it's actual measurements of direction measurements with the uh, sample meter for half a day, uh, the air mass uh, is uh, it's more or less the solar elevation, and in the, in the morning we have higher masses, in the midday we have lower masses. So this is half a day of measurements, and uh, all these measurements in the, let's say, ideal case, they form a line, and then if we extrapolate this line to the zero air mass, we have our calibration factor, or we have more or less what the instrument would measure in the uh, actual uh, uh, in volts, let's say, if our instrument measuring volts in the top of the atmosphere. Now, in order to do this uh, calibration, this calibration, language calibration technique, we need uh, uh, to have kind of constant aerosol optical depth, otherwise this line would be very variable and would not be a straight line. So, uh, to have a constant aerosol optical depth is very difficult, so in order to do that, we choose some high mountain, high elevation of high mountain areas where the aerosol is very low. So there we are kind of safe in order to say that this uh, this uh, technique can really work. 
now another uh, calibration, let's say, method or principle is a comparison with reference instruments. So, because not all the instruments can do this language plot, then some reference instruments are doing this, and then we have a comparison with these instruments from all other instruments. And one of these references is the reference uh, held by the World Optical Test and Calibration Center, which is actually a recognition agreement from WBMO and the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. Uh, and uh, in a global scale, and then we have also in a European scale the ACTRIS and the facility that is called calibration of our remote sensing that also has reference instruments, and then all the instruments of, for example, the meters of ACTRIS visit these uh, facilities in order to be calibrated. Now, these are more or less artificial calibration references because they are not based on uh, uh, the HRE system, but uh, Julian Grebner, after, after me, will talk much more about how uh, we could try to uh, to have this uh, calibration, let's say, constants related to the ESI units. Uh, now, get back a little bit to the Langley. One Langley, uh, one Langley, let's say, half a day of uh, Langley or one Langley plot uh, produces one calibration constant, so we need a number of this in order to have uh, the maximum, let's say, certainty for us that uh, this calibration is correct. And here you can see an example of six systems zero with 96 Langley calibration calibrations in uh, in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. And uh, more, if you see uh, this Langley calibration on a long-term scale for the past 15 years, there are three instruments from the host, this PFR instrument that are some photometers that have been uh, measuring this uh, Mauna Loa, which is the also calibration site for NASA IRONET. And all these blue dots are different Langley calibrations, and you can see the stability of the instrument during this, uh, the three instruments during this 15 year period, which for each instrument could be said that it's uh, better than 1%. Uh, now, in addition to the calibration, we have all this post processing, and uh, one of these is cloud plugging. So there are very different algorithms that uh, someone can use in order to detect clouds, especially think clouds is a problem. So uh, there are different algorithms to, to do that. And then for the ozone, it's something that some needs to measure. And because of the fact that not all sample photometers can have uh, an instrument that measures total problem ozone that's beside them, uh, the, most of the networks are using a climatology of ozone for the particular site. And you can see on the right uh, some publication from Cuevas et al. the differences of using actual ozone measurements uh, with red and using the climatology with blue. And the effect on the aerosolopical depth uh, using these two data sets, which is much more for now, of course, at 500 nanometers, that the ozone absorption is much uh, more important than um, that the other uh, is 70 or 40. Now, in order to calculate the uncertainty of our measurements, someone has to take into account all these factors that uh, we talked about, uh, like the signal, the field of view of the instrument technical issues, the cloud issues, problems, all the different uh, attenuators and their masses, and uh, all the measurements that are used for the post processing. And in the end, to add up all these uncertainties in order to achieve the total uncertainty of uh, this sample from either. And as an example, we can see uh, some numbers here for different wavelengths, so taking into account all, all the previous, what I said previously about, with the, about the PFR instrument. However, I think it's more complex because it's not just one number, it's a number that is also related, the uh, certain is related also with air mass, it's related with also some, somehow with AOD and uh, if you take into account also field of view issues, probably also with the effective radius of, uh, of the aerodrome. Now, the second uh, the way of measurement is the diffuse measurements. Uh, a lot of people are using the RNS measurements with uh, the different version that is doing. And uh, measurements of sky radiance in four different wavelengths that you can see here. And some very basic, uh, let's say, 
Protams, es koordinātu, protams, es esmu koordinātu simtas karjēnā Bidu, es esmu spīdēt, ka tas ir important norītīt tēmēm, kuriem ir vodīgi. It is aizdēt to mission that we cared about. We need to know the diameters of world particles and in order to understand what kind of particles and their other properties. And also, another example is the scattering phase function. So when it gets to the sun and the incoming radiation, we get different particles from smaller particles with molecules to larger particles with dust here. And uh, with a forward scatter, someone can uh, calculate the relative angular distribution of scatter light, but uh, it depends on the size and the shape of the other particles. And you can see here an example of uh, molecular scattering, biomass learning algorithms, and some dust and their uh, lady phase function. Uh, now, an example of uh, all this together and uh, taking out the average of the depth for an average of the depth constant of 0.7, you can see here the phase ignition, the single pattern of video for some cities, the Washington, Paris, and Mexico. And you can see the spectral dependence and the difference also uh, of the different single pattern of videos for this city. If you add, uh, if, uh, if you add, Biomass learning algorithm, then uh, for smoke, you can see from the Amazon and African savanna, you can see also for the same algorithm, the differences also in the in the single scattering of video spectrally and also on the level. And if you add in the end desert dust uh, and near dust algorithms, then you get different spectral uh, dependence and levels of, uh, of single scattering of video. And this introduction for the of what you will see in half an hour from uh, all the bogies that uh, taking these photometers and taking a lot of other instruments, especially satellite based or riders, someone can really discuss all these properties or in a coordinate sense. But I will not say more about that. So, why do we need this part uh, of the measurement? We need it to, from the ground, we need also to validate satellite measurement, and you can see from this paper from way that different satellites can have much different uh, ARD. So we need this, uh, and also IOD trends, especially in areas like uh, North Africa, Middle East, and East Asia, where also they are very important in terms of uh, IOD level. So we need uh, this network of uh, IOD sampleometers in order to uh, measure the algorithm. The most populated network is, of course, IRNET, uh, that most of the people use, but there are also other networks like SkyNet with computometers and also the Gopi part with uh, measurements at the uh, global atmospheric world stations that are used for this purpose. Now, how all these networks are, we try to homogenize all these measurements for different instruments and different networks. And this is an example, for example, in, for the Mauna Law, that is the calibration center for NASA IRNET. And also, there is an instrument for the World Hospital Death Health and Calibration Center, WMO reference there since 2000. And you can see here on the bottom left uh, the differences of the Arizona Hospital Death of the two instruments during, this is during the last seven years. But with different colors, you can see different reference single instruments that have been operating in Mauna Law. So someone Comparing this uh, would really comment on the continuity and the homogenization of both, uh, let's say, uh, of networks towards a certain common scale. And on the right, you can see the differences for all these uh, reference ML instruments for 500 nanometers. Uh, other types of homogenization is to bring a lot of instruments in one place, and this is something that organized our institute together with the WMO every five years. Uh, it's called interradiometer comparisons. The last one was October 2021 with 31 instruments. From uh, all the reference instruments for this global network that I mentioned, and also national network. And uh, in the two plots, you can see the differences from the argological depth of 500 nanometers and the axon exponent for all these different instruments compared with our reference uh, uh, instrument, which is the instrument called the triad of uh, the PFAS. Uh, another example of homogenization is our water network. 
uh, it started as a post action, but uh, it's essential because there are most instruments that measure in the UV range, especially in the UV, there are no optical, high optical measurements from the viewers, or there are, uh, there are no array. Uh, here, the, it's uh, the results of one campaign that was held in 2015, and uh, you can see the results in these two papers with a reference instrument, one to the PFR instrument. There, uh, you can see all the differences for all the areas that participated. But the most important thing here is that uh, things in the UV, especially in the UV, are getting more difficult because of the ozone that has to be. Uh, uh, really accurately introduced. Uh, all these uh, recommendations and uh, all these measurement principles are uh, work also in the global WMO go that has uh, different, uh, let's say, bodies. One of them is the scientific advisory group of articles. Another one is the expert team on atmospheric composition measurement and quality management that uh, up with in uh, different periods uh, issue this recommendation. The last one for all this measurement was including the sample to measure in 2015. And also now with the uh, research in structure accuracy, accuracy, there are also the standard operation procedures and also all this documentation that uh, is linked to the APC European infrastructure and sample to uh, Now, so some, uh, some, uh, uh, highlights from the Global Atmospheric Woods PFR Network that we run. It's a network of instruments that are mostly in uh, places that uh, are away from the dancers, but uh, some of them also are more close to city. Uh, these are, for example, the two examples from Geo and Alice Springs of Australia. In Perio, it's a high mountain area in Switzerland, and Alice Springs is in the middle of, let's say, the Australian desert. You can see aerodynamical depth science films and also the interannual, interannual variability of for AOD in different wavelengths with some pronouns, for example, uh, increases for, for, for open months in Alice Springs because of uh, fires in the Indonesian area. Another example is the high mountain areas that uh, we have instruments. These areas are in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, Yimperio, Design in Spain, Mount Waliguan in China, in the middle of China, and also Davos, a uh, relatively high area. You can see the differences on the average of this with uh, more uh, with higher values in Waliguan because of the proximity in, in deserts, even if it's uh, uh, an area as high as 3.8 kilometers. And also the answer component, we also can see lower answer response in Valigua due to uh, this uh, larger variables. And the same should be said about the intra-annual variability, where, for example, uh, infrared amount of amount of get very low aerosol optical depth, design at two, with the exception of uh, uh, late uh, summer and early autumn months, that there are a lot of uh, uh, intrusion, Sahara intrusion. In Dania, Davos, that it's uh, not so high mountain area, lower though still, but still, but uh, this is uh, the annual let's say, variability. And Mount Valiguan with uh, much more uh, inclusion during uh, the spring, just inclusion during the spring. Another example is the polar stations in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. Uh, here with a very big uh, dot, and you can see some uh, other results mentioning, pointing out the fact that uh, high aerosol levels can be seen in Nihalison, which is, uh, let's say, in, in northern Scandinavia, it belongs to this Norwegian area. And due to the transfer of aerosol from mainly for Europe, and much lower aerosol subject values in, uh, in the southern hemisphere. All these things, uh, all these, uh, let's say, it can be years of data and now under uh, we're trying to calculate the tracks for these areas. I'm not going to to go for each one of them, but uh, each of the sites is its, its own uh, uh, characteristics. Here is the Zania with these two modes, let's say, uh, low water optical depths uh, uh, associated with high axon exponent and higher optical depths associated with low axon exponent due to the 
that meeting. Uh, in the end, I have so only a couple of slides of the satellite data in order for you to understand the archaeological depth and also the archaeological depth for the for a paper of Adonis Gita. Here you can see speaking here uh, is the climatology on the left of archaeological depth and where high of subjects can be found, so anthropogenic, in a certain area, uh, dust, the dust there, fires. Uh, in the Amazon, Central Africa, and Indonesia. And on the right, you can see the dust contribution. Uh, as, uh, there are also, as Patricia said, there are also a lot of studies about uh, trends in this, and you can see very clear trends in different areas, like very positive trends, you see, in the Indian area, and kind of negative trends in uh, Eastern Asia, uh, with lower, let's say, uh, negative trends in Europe and uh, some part of uh, US, the US, of America. And then another uh, figure in order for you to understand how are the archaeological distribution over the globe. On the top right, you can see archaeological depth in, in, the, in the global scale. Then in the northern hemisphere, just take a look at the Arctic. And uh, on the southern hemisphere, which is Another thing is there is almost double aerosol optical depth, the contribution of dust, which is much higher in the uh, northern hemisphere. On the bottom, you can see the interannual variability and the contribution of dust, which can, that can be from 25 to 40 percent in the northern hemisphere, while in the southern hemisphere, it's only 6 to 10. Uh, and the last uh, one is about the mega cities. One is that we currently using satellite data for archaeological data in mega cities during the last uh, 18 years from the power of the Kulu. As 50% uh, of the population lives now in these urban areas, and this will be 70% by 2050, uh, there was an analysis of 81 cities with uh, of the, the 81 biggest cities with a population more than 5 million in the study. On the left, you can see the archaeological depth and the size of the public population. And on the right, you can see the archaeological depth trends with, uh, for all the cities. And if someone has to correlate this with the population data, you can see that for the India area, it has uh, an increase of the population and an increase of archaeological depth for the past 18 years. For the China area, or we have uh, also a high population increase, but uh, associated also related with or uh, accompanied with the, the negative uh, archaeological depth due to the measures of the last 20 years. In Europe and America, they are much less uh, negative, but small uh, both population wise and also AOD wise decrease. Uh, my last slide is about Harmonia that I talked about. Uh, I'm leaving this uh, post action and uh, this do with some photometers, some photometers, but also users of all this data, including climate scientists, including manufacturers, modelers, and uh, for people that are interested, just uh, go to the web page and you can join one of the working groups of Harmonia as it's a networking action and everybody is. Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, action. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I was, uh, I, I was uh, since, since the beginning, uh, starting work, um, talking about uh, homogenization and uh, all this work you're doing in Harmonia was about to ask you about the AOD trends. Uh, since the spatial temporal variability is important, however, this has been answered. So I uh, also I also gave up uh, any hope for any question from the audience here. So <laughs> I think it's uh, time to to introduce our your colleague <coughs> Julian, since he is our next uh, speaker. Okay. Uh, hello, Julian. Uh, so Julian Trevener is our next speaker. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, Julian is the leader of the MAP project, the methodology of article of optical properties. So 
In the senior sciences, has been in the World Aviation Center. He is co-leading the World Aviation Center. He has been working in the field of atmospheric physics for the past 30 years. He is specializing in radiation measurements with radiometers and spectral radiometers. And as I said, he is the coordinator of uh, the Improved Repairs of Optical Properties Project, which is uh, co financed by the European Association of National Metrology Institute, CIGRAMA, and the European Union. Thank you very much, Julian. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Stelios and uh, Andreas, for hosting this very interesting seminar. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, yes you can. Yes, yes. So I will be. <clears throat> So I will be talking about a project that has been now running for about three years on the topic of applying metrology to aerosol optical properties. And so metrology is the science of making measurements. And so this presentation will actually build up very much on the presentation that you just heard from Stelios describing uh, how you actually perform measurements of aerosol optical depth and aerosol properties and the retrieval of these characteristics. And I will mainly focus on describing different ways of producing this, uh, this data from this type of measurements. And so I will use a pointer. And to introduce my, my discussion today, I would like just to record again what we are actually trying to measure. And so what we are actually trying to measure are aerosol components in the atmosphere. And essentially, when we are doing these remote sensing measurements from the ground or the same from space, then we are actually trying to retrieve the total absorption and scattering properties of the atmosphere. And so on the right, you can see this uh, uh, schematic of the different processes that happen in the atmosphere when radiation penetrates the atmosphere coming from the sun and reaching the surface. But essentially, what is happening is what we are seeing on the, on the left side here, which Stelios already introduced, which is basically a very simple absorption and uh, scattering process where radiation goes through the atmosphere, gets scattered and absorbed, and at the bottom, an instrument is there to measure the remaining radiation. And so what we actually try to understand is how much of this radiation has been scattered and absorbed when it was going through the atmosphere. And one essential component of this is in fact how much radiation came in at the top of the atmosphere. And so this is actually one of the big, big uh, topics that we will be working on and have been working on in this project uh, map to try to understand and to find out methods on how to actually calibrate instruments to get knowledge about top of the atmosphere, about the ground-based measurements and how they relate to each other. So to introduce that and uh, to show a little bit the uh, problematic of this type of current approach, uh, I use the WMO GO PFR network that we are operating, that Stelios introduced just before, where we have uh, a global network with stations scattered around the globe. We have a reference at our institute in Davos, and the reference instruments are themselves not being calibrated in Davos because our station is not uh, high enough, the aerosols are not stable enough, the atmosphere is too variable. And so we are actually sending our reference instruments to uh, stations such as in uh, the Canary Islands or even further away to Mauna Loa to obtain a calibration using this Langley plot method that Stelios introduced. And these instruments are therefore traveling back and forth between Davos and these sites to 
have a well-defined reference to which our network instruments get calibrated, which also need to be traveling back and forth from their home locations to Davos to be calibrated in order to have a homogeneous network with a, uh, with a reference that is homogeneous and comparable throughout this network. And you can see that this is quite a lot of work and requires quite a lot of attention and complexity. So why do we care about traceability? Well, as I mentioned, metrology is science of taking measurements. And metrological traceability is very well defined. It actually means that you need to be able to provide a continuous chain of calibrations from your measurement to your reference. In our case, we would like to produce a non-interrupted chain from this network instrument sitting, for example, in Greenland, all the way back to our reference that is actually hosted in Davos. And uh, including that definition of traceability, you need also to be able to give a sort of confidence level to your measurements, which we name an uncertainty. So uncertainty just really defines how well you actually know the measurement that you are doing you need it in order to have a comparable measurement within a network and between networks. And for that, the international community has actually defined the international system of units because this is an international standard for to which all the measurements should actually be traceable. And our effort in this project is actually to try to move from the current procedure of having field calibrations to being able to have uh, uniform and uh, accepted traceability to the of units. There are different activities within this project and I will mainly focus on the traceability for aerosol optical depths as you will see in the next few slides. The instruments that we will be using and that have, are being used in this network are sun photometers mainly which are radiometers that have very narrow uh, optical filters so that the radiation from the sun that is measured by these instruments comes from a very well-defined spectral interval. We also have been introducing some more uh, emerging technologies based on spectroradiometers that are actually able to measure the full solar spectrum in a specific uh, spectral range, so not only in specific bands like the sun photometers, but really throughout the solar spectrum. And from these measurements, using various models, uh, you can then retrieve the aerosol optical depth, which is a color measurement of the amount of uh, aerosols that are in the atmospheric column, in addition to their uh, properties that are relevant for the radiation processes in the atmosphere, such as scattering and absorption characteristics. So the project really aims at providing this traceability, at standardizing these uh, retrievals of these aerosol properties, of shortening the calibration chain to reduce the amount of uh, overhead that currently is uh, employed in these networks to perform these calibrations, as you can see on this uh, bottom part of this slide. And the, a very interesting and uh, an instructive example of why such a complex procedure can be easily uh, disturbed has just happened this year or last year in December, when the volcano in Mauna Loa erupted. That was in December, it was unexpected, and uh, it just took a few days for the lava flow to actually start to cover the only road leading to the Mauna Loa Observatory, where all these different networks are actually hosting and calibrating their main radiometers to provide uh, homogenization of their network measurements. And so from one day to the next, suddenly different networks like Aeronet and even our network have become, have had a problem about calibrating their main instruments in order to have this uh, network operation. So 
So let's go a bit more into the detail of the calibration process. So this is a slide that describes the current procedure of how Aeronet, the main network that uh, produces uh, uh, remote sensing properties of the aerosols from the ground is operating. And essentially, we have two components. We have this component that I'm showing here, which is actually the measurement process to retrieve the aerosol optical depth from uh, radiation measurements. And you can see that what actually is happening is that you are taking the measurements with your instrument. You have to do a calibration that, as Stelius mentioned, uses uh, the, the Langley calibration to obtain this top of the atmosphere constants for each individual instrument from which you can obtain the aerosol optical depth. You have the second branch that is used by Aeronet to measure radiances, which is the scattered radiation from these aerosols in the sky. The calibration there, in fact, is then performed in the laboratory using uh, what is called an integrating sphere to produce a radiance calibration, which this one, in fact, is traceable to SI. And the combination of these two measurements are then used in an inversion modeling uh, algorithm to retrieve the aerosol properties. So what have we tried to do in our project? Well, the first approach that we have tried to do is to replace this Langley plot calibration with a laboratory calibration. And this would actually ex extend the SI traceability not only to the radiance measurements, but also to the irradiance measurements of the direct sun radiation. And uh, when we do that, then in fact also the measurements become SI traceable and can become intercomparable between the instruments. And uh, the one thing that actually is needed in this case is that we need to have the information about how much radiation is coming in from the top of the atmosphere using, for example, a solar spectrum that could have been measured by a satellite. So we have done this calibration with some instruments. We have actually verified and validated this approach. And you see here some example that we performed on uh, a precision filter radiometer from our network. We performed this calibration at the German Metrology Institute using a tunable laser source to define the responsivity of this uh, filter radiometer in its various channels. We combined it with the solar spectrum obtained from a satellite, so those were independent measurements from the top of the atmosphere and from the ground using this calibrated uh, sun photometer. And you can see on the bottom here the comparison between various uh, methods using either the traditional Langley-based calibration or this uh, laboratory calibration combined with uh, traceable solar spectra. And you can see the agreement was actually well within the expected uncertainties of about 0.01 in optical depth. So the uh, conclusion was that it is in principle possible. You can perform a laboratory calibration and provide aerosol optical depth within the same uncertainties as using the traditional method. We did the same with uh, some spectroradiometers quite recently, actually, last year in a field campaign in the Canary Islands. We actually hosted several instruments at this uh, high uh, altitude observatory, performed simultaneous measurements. And you can see the agreement between the instruments was quite good. Also the agreement with the sun photometers that were measuring alongside these instruments. Uh, on the bottom here, you can see actually the aerosol optical depth uh, in its uh, spectral components, where you have the UV visible region here. You have all these absorption bands that Stelius mentioned that you can measure with a spectroidometer that actually mean that in these bands, the retrieval of aerosols is complex to near impossible. But in the intermediate bands where this additional trace gas absorption is minimized or or uh, actually not existing, you can actually retrieve then the aerosol optical depths with the same quality as with the sun photometers. There are some further calibration processes that can be tried. And so instead of using both 
direct irradiance calibration and a radiance field calibration, we tried also to homogenize this calibration by using a single calibration with an additional characterization of the field of view so that this calibration then becomes uh, linked only via this uh, single calibration process. This is a second option that is actually possible. There's a third option that instead of using a direct calibration, we simply use a sphere calibration to perform a radiance calibration. It can also be linked between the radiance and the radiance measurements, again, through the knowledge of the field of view of the instrument. And so these are the two additional possibilities of performing calibrations which we tried out where we did some comparisons between these various methods on some of the instruments. You can see here on the right the comparison between these methods. Ideally, we should be uh, around one, which would mean that there is a complete consistency between the irradiance calibrations, the radiance calibration, and the field of view of the instrument. You can see there are still some discrepancies of the order of uh, three to four percent, which is something that we are still working on in order to try to understand where these differences are actually coming from. And this brings me to my concluding slide, which actually just shows you the different methods of providing traceability of these aerosol properties back to a uh, unified reference, which uh, in international standards is the uh, SI system. We have the method which uses a top of atmosphere spectrum from a satellite. You can combine that with a, a Langley calibration. You can combine it with the information on the field of view of your instrument. And this is a very interesting approach because it doesn't actually require any laboratory calibration to obtain your aerosol components. What is missing for this route is actually to have an SI traceable top of the atmosphere solar spectrum. This is currently not existing until we have fully traceable satellite experiments that provide this type of information. The middle route is the one that we have demonstrated and shown that it works very well. You perform an irradiance calibration of your instrument, you combine it with solar spectra from the top of the atmosphere, and you can then retrieve your aerosol properties quite, uh, quite well. And the third route is the one we just mentioned, which instead of using a direct irradiance calibration, uses a radiance calibration. You still will again need to combine it with your field of view measurements, you still need an information on top of the atmosphere solar spectrum. And uh, these three different routes are the th possibilities that are currently being investigated to try to provide uh, traceability of aerosol optical properties back to a common reference. Uh, and that's actually my concluding slide. So thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Julian. Uh, Stelius, may, may I ask something, Julian, because you know the project, but I'm not. <laughs> okay, okay yeah. I, I, I'm just uh, hearing uh, and seeing uh, the presentation uh, for the last 20 minutes, and I see that, okay, we, uh, we, I mean, it, it sounds to me like it's a little bit of different era in... Uh, the field of the calibration for and, and, the, and the IOD retrievals. So we are going uh, over uh, Langley plots and we have uh, standardized uh, um, spectral audiometers. Um, we, we, may we may not need in the future uh, to lose measurements to travel the AOD instruments to a location and have a, a traveling standard for that. Yes, yes, Andreas. I think you 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 understood you understood the 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 core concept of my presentation. Indeed, we are trying to provide different routes of having a consistent network of uh, measurements of aerosol properties. 
and there are different ways to achieve that i would say the main achievement would be if we can go from the traditional langley plot based calibration using in situ measurements where you need to uh, assume stability of the instruments you need to assume that they can travel that they don't age that they are robust to simply having uh, calibrations performed in in laboratories which might still be challenging for some institutes of course and which means that there will still be the need for having some dedicated calibration laboratories that will be providing this type of calibrations but the calibrations themselves will become homogeneous in the sense that the calibration traceability will be to SI and not to a narrow net master or to a PFR master or to this individual artifact instruments that will simply be defined as being the reference. So the hope is that we will be moving from this artifact based traceability hierarchy to this, uh, let's say, accepted method of uh, moving to the standard system of units. Great. Thanks for <laughs> telling me that I got it at the end. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Oleg Dubovic. Still, would you like to introduce Oleg to the audience? Yes, uh, we have the pleasure and the honor to have Oleg Dubovic uh, here to speak about uh, uh, latest uh, research. Oleg is a senior scientist at the Laboratory of Optic Atmospheric in the University of Leeds. Uh, he specializes in the retrieval of parallel properties from satellite ground based and airborne to more sensitive observations. He has been working uh, in Japan for two years, and then most of the people that uh, uh, have used the uh, army data know him from his uh, nine years of. Uh, career in NASA, where he has developed a uh, number of algorithms that are used uh, also today in, in Ireland. And since 2006, uh, he is in France as a research director. Lately, he has assembled a team that uh, deals with uh, the popular efficient software Graph, which is an open source American version software for remote sensing and can be applied in the and diverse, let's say, uh, set of observation, including passive, passive observation from satellite to the ground. And I hope that uh, we will hear more about it uh, in a while. Thank you, Oleg, for talking today. Hey, thank you, Stelios. I'll try to share the screen. Do you see it? Yes, it's fine. Okay, thanks again, Stelios, for a nice introduction. And also thank you, organizer, for this opportunity to speak at this nice workshop. And uh, in my presentation, uh, since uh, overall project called Harmonia, I also talk about Harmonia. And the title of my presentation is Harmonization of Aerosol Retrieval from Different Remote Sensing. Uh, algorithms, uh, observations. And uh, as already mentioned by Stelius, I uh, will be quite specific in my uh, talk. I'm be talking about uh, GRAS, which is an algorithm called Generalized Retrieval of Atmosphere and Surface Properties. And one of the main ideas of development of this algorithm is really harmonization of retrieval applying to different uh, of, from different observations. For example, here on the figure, you could see that this algorithm can be used for ground-based, passive, and uh, uh, an active observation, like uh, photometers and lidars, as well as for satellite, and also passive and active uh, observation. And uh, in my presentation, I probably will repeat many uh, 
many things uh, were already were said before, but nonetheless, uh, I try to uh, pursue um, uh, so the, the, uh, I have it with particular purpose, and uh, you will see what I try to say. Well, anyway, this is general structure of uh, any algorithm, and specifically of GRASP algorithm, which is uh, uh, based on two quite independent model, forward model and numerical inversion. And that, uh, I mean, I think in generally, if retrieval develop well, uh, the forward model and inversion are really independent because numerical inversion that just deal with the formal functions and, and uh, vectors and so on, while forward model can be uh, uh, can be a model from different physical phenomena. And today I'm not going to talk about numerical inversion, even it's my favorite uh, subject, simply because no time, but rather I show how we harmonize forward model and how we uh, consider it in that sense a different observation. Well, first of all, I mean, you know that well, why we can actually use optical measurements to characterize aerosol. Because we know that scattering of uh, small particles which, which, is, which are composing aerosol, they actually change radiative field. They change angular structure of the radiation once it interacts with the particle, and also the part. I mean, also we change amount of energy which is passes, and this is basically measured by such properties as extension and uh, uh, single scattered video or absorption of aerosol. Anyway, these properties were mentioned many times, which uh, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, total extinction and single scattering, uh, albedo, it's integral properties. Now, when we look at the uh, experience of um, remote sensing uh, developments, we can kind of underlie this sensitivity pattern. For example, when we deal with extinction and scattering, total extinction and total scattering, we basically have information about total concentration and a little bit about size of aerosol. Uh, well, I mean, spectral measurements is the same. I mean, yes, if you have spe spectral total extinction and scattering, that gives information about size probably. And once we have angular measurements, sensitivity increases, we can have better sensitivity to size of particles, and also we have sensitivity to refractive index and shape. If you have also measurements of polarization, then we further increase the sensitivity to those parameters which hard to get, like refractive index, shape, and size. Well, here you could see like optical thickness, which gener uh, generally retrieved by some photometers. Just before me, uh, Julian gave a nice presentation, so I'm not going to uh, talk much about just saying that uh, uh, total optical thickness directly can be measured these instruments as sound photometers. And also from spectral dependence of the optical thickness, we can judge a, a kind of in general sense about size of aerosol. Like uh, the, the, the higher value, the small particles, the smaller particles dominate aerosol size distribution, the low value is uh, correspond to uh, uh, larger particles. As for single scattering albedo, there are almost no direct measurements except uh, nephilometers, which are in situ measurements, but nonetheless they are based on optical principles. And nephilometers, we can really measure both total uh, uh, in extinction and total sc single scattering albedo. Now, it's also good to uh, see, uh, at least I always like uh, uh, to make sure, that, uh, of course, once we uh, make uh, measurements of atmospheric radiation, we know that in uh, atmosphere it's not only air, so gas, for example, atmospheric gas always present. But uh, and the effect of gaseous absorption and aerosol extinction is very different. And here is its illustration. The aerosol extinction is very smooth, while gas extinction has very, very sharp features. And this is why, basically, 
the um, instrumentation which measure gases and a uh, result uh, well generally can see the a little bit apart, even it's the same instrumentation, but uh, the retrievals considered a little bit apart because retrieval of aerosol usually done in few channels since it's smooth, where gas, gas absorption is not very strong, while gas absorption is opposite, where we see a strong line, we make measurements, try to interpret this. But of course, fundamentally, if we make measurements, they are affected by both effects. And uh, to, be, to make it kind of the best approach, we need to treat them both gas and aerosol simultaneously. Now, um, if we look at other properties of aerosol, generally atmospheric radiation characterizes by Stokes vector, an interaction of uh, uh, particles with electromagnetic wave described uh, like here, you could see uh, it's a scattering matrix which has eight elements, but if you look carefully, the, there are only six independent elements. This is a general uh, situation for uh, random, randomly aerated particles in the atmosphere. Now, if you think, uh, I mean, like, of try to bit interpret the element, for example, first, Element P11 is generally characterized intensity, which is also sensitive to result size, shape, and absorption, and uh, as also refraction index. The other five elements, they characterize state of polarization. Again, they, they, these, uh, these uh, elements sensitive to different properties of aerosol all detailed properties like size, shape, absorption, absorption and so on. And, and uh, also, um, if we try to be distinguished different elements characterizing polarization, element P12 uh, describe linear polarization when basically electromagnetic wave is uh, I mean, concentrated in one uh, plane or the other elements deal with the circular and elliptical polarization when electromagnetic wave represented by two waves shifted in different planes and you could see that electromagnetic energy kind of rotates. Now, if you look at uh, uh, how uh, different instrument uh, observe, the, uh, observe the scattering matrix, elements of scattering matrix, particularly the angular structure. Here you could see that, uh, for example, entire phase matrix can be basically measured only in situ by nephilometers. If we deal with uh, uh, ground-based measurements like uh, sky scanning radiometer, as from Ironet, we measure, uh, we can measure uh, element P11 in uh, basically forward and uh, of backward, backward hemisphere, but we don't see really backward direction. There are also uh, sky radiometers which make measurements of the linear polarization element of P12. Now, uh, if we look at lidars, which Vasilis nicely described before, they basically see one point, it's a back scattering. Of course, uh, well, it should be mentioned that Actually, LiDAR C element P22, also which is responsible for depolarization of LiDAR signal. Now, uh, if we look, for example, if we compare ground based measurements to the satellite measurements, and like, for example, measurements as MODIS, they measure, they make, they observe only one scattering angle. Uh, I mean, which basically, well, for MODIS, it's probably more or less fixed, but not fixed dependent geometry, but uh, for different single view radiometers can be uh, somewhere in backscattering, but only one point. And if you look at more advanced in that sense, it's not like multi-angular polarimeters, they can make measurements uh, in a kind of uh, half of forward uh, uh, scattering hemisphere and back hemisphere. And they can measure both uh, 
also P11 and P12. Now, uh, in order to model uh, phase, uh, phase matrix, it's not e this is not easy task because errors are actually very complex because generally we, uh, well, at least in many applications, uh, aerosol assume as spherical particles is because there is a well-established new theory for scattering of spherical particles and it's easy to use. However, in reality, particles are, it can be different shapes, different morphologies, and they don't have to be homogeneous. In our algorithm, and I say like, well, probably it's uh, one of most advanced uh, uh, model, which is still remains very simple. We use mixture of a model, a result of mixture spherical and a non-spherical fraction, which is represented by randomly oriented spheroid. And here you could see uh, what happening if we uh, compare randomly oriented spheroid with uh, spherical particles. You could see, for example, here element P12 and P22 for spheroids, different prolate and ablate spheroids. You see they have different, very different features at different angles. But if we average them, I mean, with, uh, for example, this or that size distribution, the uh, phase function becomes smooth, same as degree of linear polarization. Actually, uh, the uh, resulting uh, scattering smoother than those from me. And you could see here me, it's a red line and through it, it's a, a blue line. And uh, here is, here is it's, uh, uh, how we model in um, Aeronet and basically in many remote sensing retrieval uh, in Aeronet in GRASP uh, and many remote sensing retrieval approaches aerosol overall. Actually, we uh, we assume that aerosol can be composed by different uh, uh, different components, and when we when I say components, that means they may have different chemical structure, for example. And suddenly they have different refractive index. For example, here you could see like fine and coarse mode evidently may have different index of refraction, but we can imagine more than two mode components. And uh, each components in, uh, describe each own size distribution, each own shape distribution. The, of course, uh, assuming mixture spheroid and uh, spherical particles and each own vertical profile. Of course, and certainly depending on the application, we can uh, simplify this model, like assuming one of those uh, parameters known or parameterize it using function depending on very few parameters. But anyway, once uh, we have this model, we can, and we have a, a single skeleton uh, mod possibility to model single skeleton albedo, we can make a number of different retrievals where only single scattering albedo plays role. For example, this is a version of a full uh, scattering matrix made uh, by uh, uh, we made it by uh, colony kilometers. And this is example of uh, inversion of photo suspension, uh, water suspension particles. And you could see we got uh, a distribution which agree very well with in situ measurement shape distribution, you see that particles are really spherical and refractive index real imaginary part. Well, another case where in most at least application only single scattering will be the single scattering approximation used is a LIDAR observation. Vasilis talked very nicely about that. I will not talk much because you could see here LIDAR equation, which as Vasilis uh, uh, underline the basically each for back scattering each measurements depend on two values like kind of extinction and lidar ratio and lidar ratio itself uh, depend on type of aerosol so either we assume this uh, lidar ratio or calculate it from some a priori information of course there are more advanced sliders where uh, backscattering uh, ratio measured directly like uh, around LIDAR, so it is a
Now, if we look at the uh, remote sensing from satellite and even from ground, I mean, not even, but also from ground, as those of IronNet, we have to understand that uh, there are also, uh, we need to account for multiple scattering interaction. And here you could see that uh, if we have a full scattering matrix, as well as extension and single scattering albedo, we need to solve a radiative transfer equation where we account for an interaction between absorbed scattering, gaseous absorption, molecular scattering, and also surface reflectance. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to mention, but I forgot, that everywhere I underline that most of measurements are uh, focused on two elements, P11 and P12, and the rest of elements are rarely measured. This is because it's uh, very difficult, but there is another reason also for that. And here I would like to outline that once uh, we, ca we uh, consider a sun as a source of energy and uh, sun uh, radiation is depolarized, you could see here only the first element, element of the vector equal one. And if we solve this equation, we see that uh, measurements by passive observation, intensity dominated by uh, element F uh, of uh, one one of uh, scattering matrix. As for polarization measurements, is dominated by uh, this uh, element F of one two divided by F one one. So basically degree of linear polarization. This is why these two elements are usually tends to be measured and can see that more than other elements. Now, this is quick illustration that if we need to account for surface reflectance, we need to account for bidirectional reflectance and also bidirection polarized reflectance if we, um, if we uh, have polarimetric measurements. And here, a few uh, models. All these models are kind of semi-empirical, depending on, on, a, on a few parameters. And overland, uh, I mean, there are kind of two groups of measurement of uh, models overland. You could see here, uh, like uh, around Tim Tiri Strait or uh, Lee Ross, very popular model. There are also uh, there are models of polarized uh, <coughs> directional reflectance, and I put here number of models. But for the uh, uh, for the old ocean, it's very famous Cox model, Cox Monk model, and this is a kind of physically based model which use calculate both PRDF and the PTF, and uh, there are similar models, for example, suggested by Pavel Litvinov for land, and we have this on in grasp, and once all this. Uh, radiative transfer counted, we can do ironet like retrieval, but we can do also satellite like retrieval since uh, I have not much time. I just you demonstrate that what we did with an um, inversion of polder grass. Polder is multi angular polarimeter, uh, French polarimeter in space, and we could retrieve like optical thickness, thermal exponents in the scale beta, scale height, and so on and uh, many other parameters and uh, advantages of our algorithm we try to minimize kind of a priori or assumptions or if you use we use a very general one which equal, equally applied for any kind of points i mean globally and this makes our retrieval more kind of aligned with measurements rather than with our own assumptions and uh, here i just want to kind of summar not summarize, but at least to provide you global vision how the, uh, like our forward model in grasp look like, and it can be any forward model, any other algorithm, and it's very uh, modular. For example, if you look only at aerosol surface and gas parameters of atmosphere, we understand that once we uh, simulate our forward Observation: We need to model aerosol single scattering, uh, scattering 
let's go calculate optical thickness in the scriptal video phase matrix and uh, if needed we should uh, also assign the vertical profiles if there is sensitivity we also uh, can uh, using gas uh, parameters we calculate gases absorption and using surface parameters we calculate uh, BRDF and DPRDF and already these parameters we can use for some application like I said for polynephilometers if we work only with that and our algorithm would not run multiple scale for example but if we go for the uh, observation uh, like tools from uh, photometers or satellites or radiometers from the space we need to also enter act of multiple scattering uh, solving uh, radiative transfer equation and then using this model we can basically model i mean uh, maybe not everything but most of uh, uh, remote sensing observation and this is uh, well structure of our grasp algorithm as i said like it's a very modular kind of lego we can deal with a different instrument like nephilometer, lidar, radiometer, spectrometer from space, from ground, and we have one unique in, in, uh, inversion uh, module which works perfectly for all application. And uh, wh why all this harmonization important? It's especially important to get consistency between interpretation of different different. Uh, observation and also it's a very important once we want to develop synergetic retrieval and uh, uh, Vasilis already mentioned so I'm not going to talk much but still would like to mention this is good example of uh, like our garlic grasp approach where we invert simultaneously LIDAR multi angle LIDAR and uh, net observation and uh, uh, doing that, we can get more interesting results than from uh, each instrument separately. Specifically, we can retrieve the distribution of fine and coarse mode separately, also real and imaginary path separately of each uh, L, uh, for uh, each component and single scattering video. This is for columnar properties, but for vertical properties, we have two profiles for fine and coarse mode and we also can generate any profiles of other properties for example single scattering albedo and this uh, approach already used by number of groups and another interesting synergy which uh, probably not everyone thinks but we work in this with that it's a synergy of satellite and ground-based measurements for example uh, like aronets and photometer and uh, satellite what is a idea behind that what is it what is the uh, interest to doing that interest is that uh, our net or uh, sky radiometric measurements for ground very sensitive to many most of properties of aerosol and kind of have highest information content however they also affected by assumption of surface reflectance and in that sense uh, when we make measurements from satellite the situation is completely opposite uh, satellite sensor measurements dominated by surface properties and therefore when we interpret satellite measurements we always need to separate these two effects once we combine two both information we have very good constraints for both and aerosol and we can retrieve both properties in the best way and here we can develop kind of a data set of not only aerosol uh, i mean uh, not only value uh, quite accurate aerosol information but also surface properties which are very important for validating uh, satellite measurements and tuning algorithms well also we are combining different satellite data well, here i show just uh, well it's the name of project with either which we have and we combine all GB, all GA, and also Sentinel S5P. And well, maybe in this illustration it's not obvious, but the combination provides generally better results for any single 
a single satellite observation, not only in the coverage, but also in quality of the retrieve parameters. And here I'm coming to the end, just uh, uh, show you a website of our grasp open algorithm, which is open, and it's kind of a, a quite nice tool to try different approaches, different synergies, and different uh, uh, interpretation of different data. So, um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Uh, Thanks, Thanks a lot, Oleg, for, for your presentation. Uh, I, I was about to, to ask you about the possibilities and the applications of GRASP and the, and the synergy with different instruments. Uh, you mentioned a lot. Uh, I would like to ask you if you have any comment about uh, the synergies of GRASP with uh, all the radiance is coming from all sky images. Uh, we're working a lot though, with images here at Patra, so I would be glad to hear your comment on this. I mean, which instrument? Or, or all, which, all, all, all sky, sky images. images. We've seen, seen in the literature the... in the last two years that we can use radiances coming from all sky images with the grasp derived aerosol properties as well. Yeah, this is ca cameras, yeah, kind of sky. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, we have some applications uh, and it's working pretty well. Uh, uh, of course, there is uh, issues that. Uh, accuracy of these measurements uh, not as high but it's clear that it's kind of promising approaches because with sky camera you get you get all angles and uh, i mean normally it's provide more information the difficulty is that uh, it's kind of saturates uh, around sun uh, in direction sun and uh, and, and then there is, it's not possible or very difficult to also uh, use direct measurements with sky camera. And another problem is uh, absolute calibration. We often even invert, just say inverting relative measurements, but still it's, uh, it's provide interesting results. I think it's interesting direction. And we can walk in that direction. We are Yes, th thank you. Thanks a lot. So, uh, Stelius, are there any more questions for you? No. So we have discussed a lot uh, lately with all different aspects, and yeah, for me, grass is a a tool that can uh, be useful also for for students. I mean, it's an open access, and students can play with it and try different ideas, and if there is an idea that's really outside the, the box, let's say, probably they can contact the, the GRASP team and discuss it. That's my, my view on GRASP. I mean, it's very, very unique instrument, let's say, to work with. Great. Great. So, so thanks a lot again, Oleg. Uh, now, please, please. Yes. Quick mention that uh, actually, since Telio said, uh, uh, we will have a GRASP uh, summer school in May. If some of students interested, it's still, there is still room to sign, for you, to sign in for that and come. Yeah, thank you. That, <laughs> that, that would be great. We have, I think that we have already some registered students from Patra, so we'll try to, to put in some more. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, uh, we actually, we're going on a break uh, for half an hour. I will we'll see you at uh, 12 City. Thanks a lot, everyone. Keep in touch. It, is, yes, it looks fine with me. Uh, Stylus, would you like to... First of all, welcome everybody again. It's uh, 12 City, so we'll start. Uh, Stelius would like to uh, say a few words about our next speaker, Sarah Vassar for W. Thank you.
Uh, we've been working at the researcher in the Barcelona Computer Computing Center till uh, in the last year. Uh, she is the time, she was the scientist in charge till uh, also end of last year uh, of the WMO standard task of warning advisory and assessment system. Uh, the regional center for Northern Africa, Middle East and Europe, and the WMO regional specialized neurological center. Uh, with uh, specialization on atmospheric sun and dust forecast in the Barcelona Dust Forecast Center. It has been leading a number of European projects. One of them was the post action for wind dust that has to do with measurement modeling and mostly effects of dust. And since January 2023, she's now the science officer at uh, the World Neurological Organization. So she will present. Uh, uh, the research and, uh, in, in the and the sun and dust problem. So thank you very much for doing it. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Asterius, and I think that you're some of my slides, but it's okay. Uh, as Asterius said, uh, I'm based in Geneva, so in January, I'm science officer associated to this Global Atmosphere Watch program that you show in previous talks. And it's basically the atmospheric composition and air quality research branch at WMO. And because my background is focusing mostly on sun and dust storm today, I will introduce you some important concepts associated to sun and dust storms and climate and air quality. I think that I will be the speaker with no questions because I will I will show more, I will show more effects on climate and air quality than um, some algorithms. And equations, but I hope that you will be happy also to listen. To and then, just for putting aerosols in all this context, just keep in mind that the aerosols has a variety of shapes, chemical compositions. This is mostly related with the sources of these aerosol emissions, and we can find some more mineral dust, salt, sea salt, but also some biotic uh, or or the biotic uh, aerosols like pollen, virus, or bacteria. And just keep in mind that the size is quite challenging in this description of the aerosols, because mostly anthropogenic aerosols are in the fine part, in the fine fractions, let's say what we call particle matter uh, uh, below 2.5 micro, micrometers is mostly anthropogenic. And then when we move to a coarser size, this PM particle matter with the diameters of 10 micrometers, we are going more to the natural ones. That is basically uh, mineral dust and sea salt. And why is it so, so important? Because if you think uh, in the estimation of the aerosols at global scale, we can see how sea salt and uh, mineral dust, natural aerosols, are by large the most important contributors to the aerosol budget at global scale. But here we have to emphasize that this is in mass. If we think in optical properties, that are all the discussions that you show in the previous session, is is thus the most abund abandoned aerosol at global scale, and this has implications in the estimation of the climate change and with the forcing and all the associated elements to this uh, to this characterization of the aerosols. Basically, you can you can measure aerosols with different sensors from satellites, also in situ and ground-based uh, measurements. Also, you have the more uh, near surface characterization based on chemical composition. We have measurement measurement campaigns, as the ones that Vasily show with prototypes that can help us to improve our knowledge about aerosols and to describe better their, their physical properties. But one of the big discussions is how you can filter, for example, desert dust from the bulk aerosols of your measurements. And in this case, it's important that we know exactly what is the features that distinguish dust from the rest of the aerosol. And basically, to give you an idea, what you have to keep in mind is that desert dust can be characterized by the core size, the regular shape. This is associated with the polarization and the large absorption. And this is key, basically, because it's the feature that differentiates dust from maritime, for example. Maritime aerosols, sea salt, are also coarse sized, but they are having a less uh, absorption power. Then we can somehow uh, 
do some filters based, based in these main three properties of tether task. And what is extension? As, as in some previous slides, you see the extension of the aerosols is, is broad and depends on the source, it's more limited in a region. But in the case of the desert dust, it is in orange in this uh, nice image that is a simulation coming from NASA Geospy uh, model. And here is plotted the aerosol optical depth, meaning optical properties. You can see how dust, even if it's emitted in sources, can be spread around the world meaning that it's having a global impact. And here you have a more or less of the sources of desert dust. You have the famous Sahara and also Middle East, some areas of important emission in Asia, like the Taklaman and the Gobi deserts. But as you can see also in this image, there are some sources in North America, South America, South Africa, and even Australia. That means that this is a global problem and a global phenomenon. We have to understand that we have a cycle that is, uh, starts from the mission, but also is important the meteorological conditions that powers the transport and the deposition of these of these dust emitted from from these more arid regions, uh, and this has implications later on in in the impacts that we can define. Basically, what is important that you understand is that dust emission is something really connected with the meteorology, with the surface winds. It's the first uh, ingredient that you have to keep in mind all the time. For the reason, it's so important in the WMO level because it's considered as, as a meteorological hazard because uh, the, 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 the first click that uh, is the, the first element that powers this emission is the wind coming from weather and, and weather systems. But also it's important that you keep in mind that for the transport and for uh, the depositions and also even for the mission, precipitation and other factors like land surface factors are key for this, for this uh, emission and, and transport and deposition. And also it's important that you connect everything with cycles and this means that there is a clear seasonal pattern for the desert dust activity with maximums in the summer boreal months, like uh, uh, March, April, May, and June, July, August in the North Hemisphere. As you can see here, no, uh, Sahara and Middle East are really uh, emphasized during these seasons. Meanwhile, in the boreal winter time, this means December, January, February, and uh, September, October, November, oops, we have mm, larger activities in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see in Australia, some signals, also in South America. Then it's really connected with the meteorology and the climatology of the, of the region. In this context, you, that I want to emphasize the component of the weather, the importance of the weather in this dust uh, process, we can distinguish different types of sun and dust storms. Basically, we have the large ones that are connected with synoptic dust storms that are providing you this, this increase of surface winds that are producing the dust emission and are connected with basically frontal, frontal winds, connected with cyclones, but also it can be connected with large uh, scale freight winds. In that case, it's in this image of the Elmet Satter GP product, you can see in pink is the contribution of dust and in red is basically clouds. And as you can see here, this is the, the winter in, in the Sahelian season. Uh, is the dusty season in this area because the hard mass can winds that are these winds that are global driven and can produce these organized systems of sun and dust at the same moment because everything at least because this global wind. But also you have mesoscale dust storms that are more connected with uh, topography, orography, convection, and you can see here examples. The most, the most uh, important example is the Baudelaire. Why? Because the Baudelaire is the most important hotspot of dust at global scale. And the main reason is because it's a Baudelaire, in the Baudelaire there is a depression that accumulates sediments, but also you have uh, a system of two mountains that produce a wind channel tunnel that favors that there will be a lift of dust all the time. Then in all satellite images, you will see always this hot spot of dust in the middle of the Sahara, that is the Baudelaire. But also we have a smaller scale like dust devils, 
that is basically uh, because the convection is creating this bubble of air and then uh, if there is conditions in which the air dust is uplifted, we will have lift. But also we have haboobs. Haboobs are these convective cells that produce this amazing wall of dust that maybe you see in some pictures, but also in videos in Arizona, in Iran, in Africa. It's really like extreme event that is one of the most harmful for, 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 uh, for the identification of impacts in society. And also you have to be aware that when we talk about deserts, we talk about not the typical one that you have in your, in your, in your mind, that it can be this one, the, the bottom one. When we talk about desert sources, it, there is a variety of, of types of deserts. And this has implications in the size of the particles that can be emitted from the different types of soils. And this is, will have implications later on with the estimation of the AODs and all the things that you saw in previous talks from, from the rest of lectures of today. Keep in mind that this is all the pictures that are coming from North Africa escapes, land escapes. And as you can see that there are some of them that are more rocky, some of them are more vegetated, and some of them are more sandy. And basically, you have to keep in mind two concepts more that is a distinguish between sand and dust. That is basically based on the size of the particle. We say that sand is the coarsest one, and the dust, we, we consider dust the ones that are more finer, and are the ones that are more easily transported in long-range transport regions. And also, you will have the mission, and basically for the mission, is the main ingredient again is the dust, uh, the wind, sorry, but you can see that there are different types of, of phenomena associated to dust emission. It can be considered because the big, the big rolling and in during the rolling are emitting finer dust particles. Also, we have the saltation, that is this phenomena where a medium particle is jumping and produce the spread of the dust, or directly we have the suspension when the the dust is uplifted directly from the ground. The most effective phenomena, the most effective mechanism for the dust emission is the saltation. For, just for your information, but this will be the concept. And also we have to take account the conditions uh, in the moment that we want to, to, to analyze the events, because it's not the same that you will be in the dry season, that in the wet season, the top images are going from the same landscape and it's basically different season. Then you can imagine that during the dry season we will have more activity than during the wet season where the water is needed any emission from the ground. Also, it's important to model or to know about changes along the year because the presence of the snow or if there is a period of drought that can affect also the how dust will be more easily uplifted or not. And also, you have to keep in mind that not all of the dust emissions are coming from natural sources, big deserts. Also, there are dust emissions coming from anthropogen, more anthropogenic activities, or we call more anthropogenic sources. It can be agriculture, resuspension, mining, also uh, animals moving uh, the, the, the soils. It can be a factor, but also uh, when we have drugs in some areas like lakes, it can be uh, potentially a new source of dust that is this dry lake, for example. And this is an example uh, from a work uh, done by Paul Gino, that is one of the most preferred uh, dust researchers internationally in the community, that did this estimation in this paper of Chinu et al. 2012 about the estimation of these potential anthropogenic sources coming from agricultural areas, changes in the soil more driven by the natural inter uh, the human intervention. And here it has a nice summary that is this graphic that is estimating these natural versus anthropogenic uh, sources of the of different areas around the world. And if you see here, for example, in North Africa, clearly we have a very important contribution from natural sources, but also there is a component that is uh, anthropogenic, and it's basically these areas you may think that you can see here that are mostly associated with agricultural regions in the South. 
But if we come, for example, to Australia, we have the reverse thing. We have like natural contribution is going like 25% versus the 75% that corresponds to anthropogenic. And everything has implications in the impacts that Hernandez of Stones has in, in weather, in climate, but also in our daily lives, not just uh, weather and climate, it's also infrastructures, economy, and so on. And uh, going to the, to the implications in, in climate and weather is basically what you were listening in, in previous talks. All these interactions with the light and the aerosol has implications in the balance that we are estimating of the radiative forcing. Then for aerosols, and particularly for dust, we have a direct effect, that is the presence of dust, how it's reflecting and absorbing light. Then we have an indirect effect that is connected with the cloud formation, because dust can be a seed for clouds uh, as acting as an ice nucleation. But also there is implications in heterogeneous chemistry, in the how air quality can change due to the presence of dust. And also, it uh, can produce ch uh, changes in the albedo of the cryosphere. Because if there is dust that was on the ice on, or in, on the, the snow, this will reduce the reflection of light in these more bright surfaces. Also, the deposition can be good. It can, be, it can, can have an effect positive, like uh, because uh, mineral dust uh, contains idols and phosphorus that are basically um, nutrients, and then it's good for the production of phytoplankton and some, um, some fertilizations on land. But also, it can be a negative effect if you think in glaciers because it can pick up the melting of this ice. Also, it's important the connection with the water management because it can favor the desertification and desertification increase the area of dust emission, meaning that you will have uh, more dust potentially. And also changes in vegetation due to drugs or things uh, associated with the growth of, of plants can affect also the estimations that we have for, pro for projections of sand and dust storms. Here there is an example coming again for Pong Jilu that shows how is is changing the simulation of one climate model if you have uh, into account the changes in the vegetation, the red one, versus a non-connected uh, vege uh, vegetation model in your simulations, in which it disappears completely flat. And also going for climate change and the importance of this new paradigm of temperatures, here it's important that with the increase of temperatures, there are some emerging areas that can be potentially emitted, emitted dust, and these areas are concentrated in high latitudes, like in Canada, Groenlandia, Icelandia, Scandinavia, also New Zealand, South America, or, or even Antarctica. And basically, the important thing of this concept is that they are having completely different chemical and optical properties, because the soils are completely different, then this has implications also for the estimation of these potential sources in future projections. And for giving you an idea about the concept of how important is the composition, the chemical composition of the, of the soils, here you can see an image of Morris that I think that is the best one that I can represent this, this phenomenon. That you have here the north of Bolivia, and you have uh, one event coming from different parts of the region. You can see here the difference in colors that is basically connected with the difference in the minerals that contains the soil. And this is also having, again, implications in the retrievals that the, the satellite and remote sensing instruments are considering for retrieve aerosol properties. Thanks God, there are some missions that are now working for the typing this kind of mineral composition on the soils that are the NASA EMIT and the, the German map. And fortunately, this will help us to really constrain the, the effects of mineral dust in climate. Just to give you an idea, keep in mind that each mineral has key implications in key specific processes of climate. For example, hematite are more connected with the direct radiative effect, or feldspar is more connected with the ice nucleation processes. Then to can advance in the estimation of the real impacts of, sand and, of dust on climate effects, we have to assess also 
these uncertainties in the composition. And it's because all this context that WMO launched the San Andalusian Warming Advisory System. Basically, this program serves to improve the products, to monitor and predict dust, to facilitate this information to potential users, and to strengthen the capacity of the countries to on the use of these tools that the research community is, is facilitating to all of us. Basically, nowadays, it's building the concept of regional nodes. We have three nodes running, one in Asia, one in, in North Africa, Middle East, and Europe, and the other one is covering the region of Pan America. And as Stelios mentioned, also there are two centers in Barcelona and Beijing that are coming to produce operational dash forecast in the regions that they have assigned. The three websites of the three regional centers are publicly available. You can have everything there. There are observations, there are model outputs, there are other events that can be in your interest, like this one. It is announced in the website of the Barcelona Das Regional Center. But also in the framework of the United Nations, you have to be aware that the impacts of dust in, in the different sectors and also the implications in future promotes this UN coalition for combating sun and desert storms, that is an alliance of more than 15 agencies that are working on the assessment and mitigation of sun and desert storms in society. And there are many documents, many uh, assessments that we are trying to constrain what is the real impact of dust in different sectors, not just, uh, not just for example, in ecosystems like the oceans, also in, in socioeconomic activities like aviation, ground transportation, solar energy, and other many activities that are connected with these implications. And as Estelius mentioned, this connection with the users and the impacts in society was the reason that we promote INDAST. INDAST is basically a cost action as Armonia. I was glad to share this cost action. Estelios and many of the members of the panelists today was part of this effort. And we want to promote really applied science, try to connect with users and to understand their needs and to try to use the current knowledge that we have about sun and dust storms and the tools and the products that we promote for really help them in the mitigation and adaptation of this risk that is the sun and dust storms. And this is an example of impacts in our daily life. All of these pictures are coming from uh, European countries. The first one is Almeria last year. The second one is Crete in 2018. We have Canary Island in 2020, in 2020. Also, Paris was hit in time to time uh, on San Andreas Stones. And this is a, a nice uh, sequence of how it can change the visibility uh, in Tenerife. This is Santa Cruz de Tenerife. Uh, how is changing the visibility when a San Andreas Stones, a severe San Andreas Stones, is arriving to a city? You can see this has implications also in electricity consumption in reduction of visibility and probably increase in, in traffic accidents. And it's because of these reasons that it's so important to promote the observations and the uh, prediction of San Andreas Astor. All this work is now considered inside this Barcelona Andres Regional Center of WMO. And just for finalize, I want to show you the kind of things that you can find in the website. You can find forecast products with daily forecast. You can evaluate with IronNet and Modis. This you can compare the model with uh, IronNet and Modis. But also you have products on RGB from satellites from Emmetsat or visibility. And because I'm late, I will skip the comparison. This is a comparison of one event. You can go to the website and check by yourself. And I will thanks a lot your your time and to stay connected during my talk. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Want to thanks, want to thanks especially my former institute, that is the Barcelona Institute for Computing Center, and also all the partners mm -hmm. and, and people that is contributing to the SDS Wars, also all the contributors that we've had in the INDESC uh, network, that it was really like amazing and I hope that you take benefit of all this work. Thank you.
Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks for the nice pictures. No questions for sure. <laughs> so, Lily, would like to, to put a question for, for Sarah? Or may you ask something? I'm wondering how uh, uh, Harmonia is taking, uh, you know, the uh, the sequel from uh, from Indus and how uh, the re results from uh, Indus are related to uh, will be used in the next uh, cost action. That's in right fact, in Indus we had experts from research communities like modeling, atmospheric composition monitoring. And in this monitoring site, there were in situ and also satellite experts. And one of the things that was really discussed, it was the typing of the aerosol. How we can really filter the aerosol type from the different products that remote sensing communities can provide. And also to assess that the quality of all these data sets and how we can combine them. That is connected with the talk of Oleg, that it, these synergistic approaches are super important because we have many platforms of monitoring dust, not just coming from satellites, also in situ sensors that are coming from lidars, neocalimeters, and photometers, and we have to assess the veracity of the information that we, we got from them. Thank you. <laughs> great, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, we, may, we may go for, for our next speaker. Thanks again, Sarah. Then our next speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Pop from DLR. DLR. Uh, Still, would like to make a short introduction from Thomas. Uh, yes, uh, Thomas, are you here? Yeah, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Thomas Pop uh, works in the Zerman Aerospace Center, DLR, the Zerman Remote Sensing Data Center, and he's a good head of uh, the Radiation Department, and uh, Department of Atmosphere, a DLR Senior Earth Scientist, that he graduated from the Metaphysics and Meteorology from Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He designed a league of uh, the service manager of several NASA projects like the Climate Change Initiative CCI and comparing to Climate Change Services like the CGS, contracts like the atmospheric composition and sensor climate variables. And since 2010, he is working on satellite aerosol retrieval algorithms, their evaluation and creation of consistent multi behavior climate data records, and also leading contracts and user interaction for the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and the floor is yours. Thank you. It's my pleasure to join you. I'm sorry that I could not be with you for the whole morning session. Um, I have other meetings, also I will have to leave shortly after my part. But I will do my best to give you a bit of flavor of the satellite aerosol retrievals. And now I'm sharing my presentation. So can you see it? And is it in presentation form? No, it's yes, sir. Okay, then I go ahead. Yes. So here's the outline of my talk. I have a short introduction. I will give you some images. I think they tell most. I will not go very deeply into the maths. And then I will talk about um, how we ascertain the quality, the uncertainties, the consistency of our products. And I will end with a conclusion. <clears throat> um, yeah, in my kind of introduction, um, the projects I'm working on and I'm having the pleasure to lead were already mentioned. So these are subsequent series of projects on, funded by ESA and by the Copernicus program and by Horizon Europe. And there is a large community involved. So I have several places in my slides where you will see um, links to publications by some of the colleagues I'm working with, but there is a much wider community and several in the room have been part of it or are part of it. And I want to acknowledge all this rich um, content from everyone. Um, yeah, just 
two slides for motivating again why satellite aerosol information is useful. Of course, it's useful for climate change and better understand and constrain IPCC forcing, but it's also useful to constrain very practical aspects like um, solar energy and dust was mentioned already as a major um, quantity in the atmosphere that can reduce solar energy radiance. Um, we know aerosols at the surface as air quality, as um, particulate matter, and the link is not easy from what the satellite sees to this. And also people using satellite observations of the land and the ocean surface, they need to get away with this blue veil um, which can be introduced by aerosols. Um, dust over ocean is one of the most prominent cases where you can really see the aerosol from space in RGB, in uh, visible images. Um, but we have to be aware that aerosols have many sources which are depicted on the right, volcanoes, fires, industrial burning, um, Sahara and other desert dust or sea salt from the oceans. And they have different forms and different chemical compositions. So Sarah made the point about the importance of aerosol typing and also the challenges in this. Um, I will not go, as I said, very much into mathematical details, but to give you an, a flavor of the principle for one of the very simple um, possibilities to invert aerosols from observations of the satellite and optical spectral range. Here's the principle. So you see here the reflectance increasing to the right with aerosol optical depth increasing to the top. And you see this for different surface brightnesses. So from left to right, the surface brightness is increasing. And if you have such a quasi-linear or a definite relationship, this can be used to invert the signal and to get information of about aerosol quantity, about the aerosol optical depth, total extinction in the column. Um, but you have to also constrain the surface brightness. And if you look closely into this, the further to the right, the brighter the surface, the less steep this curve gap. And this means the less sensitive the signal is to the aerosol. If you take even brighter surfaces, you can cut situations where there is no sensitivity or where you have a vertical line and the, the signal is more or less independent of aerosol. So the, one of the most important challenges in optics is to separate aerosol from the ground signal and this works best over dark surfaces like ocean. Um, if you want to get more information about different aerosol types, then you need more than one independent observation. So you need, need different wavelengths, you need different viewing angles, you need polarimetric information, um, and then you can work with this to get more information out of this. Or you combine different sensors which provide all these um, independent observations. So let me talk a bit about the challenges for aerosol retrieval from satellite. Normally the inversion problem is mathematically ill posed so we have less ob independent observables or less pieces of information than we would need. And this means we have to work with some climatology or assumptions or parameterizations to solve it. Um, then the uncertainties of the product of the aerosol optical depth in the first place are dependent strongly on the conditions of the retrieval, in particular itself on the aerosol content. So if, you, if we want to get something out about aerosol type, and we have only very little aerosol in the atmosphere, then the signal carries only very small part of information on this. And this makes it um, difficult, in particular as these conditions also depend with the viewing angle and the sun angle. So um, it's a highly variable situation when we can really trust in the results and when we have large uncertainties. Um, yeah, I mentioned this separation of the ground signal. Um, aerosols, as everyone dealing with aerosols knows, are highly variable, much more than um, well-mixed greenhouse gases in space and time. And also, in addition, they are variable in their 
composition, which also changes their optical properties. Then for air quality, we want to know mass concentrations near the surface, which is not um, directly linearly related to the total column optical properties that we can measure from satellite. So the, the transfer is a different, difficult function. Um, and then, if we think about climate observations, which need long records, normally the lifetime of individual satellites is shorter than the 30-year climate data set, and therefore we need to combine similar instruments, and this is again a challenge. So as I said, if we can combine different pieces of information, of independent observations, then we have complementary information. And this is why we work with a set of different instruments, radiometers, spectrometers, polarimeters, thermal interferometers, get as much as possible of different viewing angles, wavelengths, um, ranging from the UV to the thermal infrared, um, and, and get some information out on the aerosol properties. So this is um, discussing the methodology. And now then, I start with showing you a few examples to illustrate what you can see from satellite. So here you have for one satellite, it's Mr. on Sentinel-3, one algorithm. Um, four months, um, global maps of aerosols. So you will see, for example, the biomass burning in Africa moving to the south from early in the year to later in the year. The South American biomass burning season in autumn. You see um, permanent spots like India, um, yeah, and many more elements, typical features. Dust outbreak, of course, to mention. Um, then this is another set of maps, global maps again, and here you get a flavor what you can observe from satellites. In the first instance, we see optical properties of aerosol. So we can break the total aerosol optical depth, which is shown here on the upper left, into components. First of all, on the right upper, you see the fine mode LED. So this is all particles smaller in diameter than one micron. So this is bio everything from burning and from secondary organic processes and black and organic carbon. And then in the lower, Right, a lower left, you see um, another piece of the total AUD, which is only the mineral dust coming from desert areas. Um, so these are large particles and uh, non spherical in most cases. Um, and you see that of the total column, um, total aerosol optical depth, and the dust and the fine mode, this is almost the whole load of aerosol, and what is missing is sea salt between those components, which is very difficult to insert from satellite. And on the lower right, you get another information, which is absorption in the name of single scattering albedo, so the part of scattering of the total extinction, ranging from 0.75 to 1. Um, and if you look into these images in the lower left of each of them, there is a sensor name. Um, and the algorithm name. So we work with a combination of different sensors to get this, these pieces of information. Um, what we can get out of this um, is then here a case a study under the lead of um, Lasse Sotacheva from FMI. Uh, time records, in this case for Southeast China. And you see here different algorithms, different sensors used to get these time records. You see that in the first part, there's only one sensor that had measurements, and this is POMS. Um, and then in the later part, you see many different data sets which have a similar pattern, but they have offset. And these are due, for example, to different treatment of clouds in the retrievals, because clouds have to be avoided as contamination. Um, so if you do a bias correction of all the individual records, you get this um, merge data set, and this gives you then the temporal evolution of um, aerosol optical depth for a region. And if you compare then for this period the record for Southeast China with the one for Europe, 
you see this interesting first increasing and then decreasing tied to um, emission reduction measures in China. And in Europe, you see a very slow but um, steady decrease over this period. Yeah, a last point on um, examples, what can be done with satellite retrieves. I mentioned that clouds are contamination, so a cloud misinterpreted as aerosol leads to a significant overestimation of aerosol from satellite. Um, there are also work in progress for algorithms that retrieve both aerosols and clouds at the same time and do a probabilistic assignment. So you see here the reddish color for cloud optical thickness and the greenish color, bluish color for aerosol optical thickness. And here you see that both can be retrieved with this algorithm by colleagues from reference in, in Brussels. Um, but there are also issues with this, um, really finding the appropriate assignment when the probabilities are similar and the optical depths are similar of both parts. Um, yeah, this is, uh, was a few examples and there are many more and many more satellites um, products around, but I cannot go into more broad uh, description in the short time. Important is also to establish the quality of the product. So what we do, and there has been a kind of standards developed over the last two decades in the community, and is that we look at um, these box whiskers, or the spread of retrieval results versus the reference, which is the network from Aeronet sun photometers, as a function of the Aeronet aerosol optical depth. So we can see, for example, in the lower left, um, a general overestimation for this sensor slister on Sentinel 3D, and it's even a bit larger for very low values. You can also look at this in the middle in form of, of histograms for low and high errors in optical depth, or you can look at maps globally to understand whether its um, bias is regionally dominated or globally um, rather homogeneously distributed. Um, I show here now also a statistical comparison for the, what I think the most challenging quantity, the single scattering albedo, retrieved with the grasp algorithm, OLED scoop in the middle. Um, and you see here, there is significant scatter because it's so challenging, but there is also um, with a range of from 0.75 to 1, of single scattering albedo values, there's an RMSE of 0.05, so that's 20% uh, of the range, and this means there is information in it, which is very important for um, forcing calculations, for example. And finally, we do also look into stability, and here I have an example for the thermal infrared YASI instrument and different algorithms that um, I use including an ensemble algorithm that combines the strengths of all the individual algorithms. And you see here the normalized mean bias over time. So you can judge if it's a flat curve, and then there is a good stability. If there is a trend, then there is a remaining instability. Now this brings me to uncertainty characterization. So trying to predict within the retrieval um, how large the error bars statistically are to be expected. And I don't want to go into this in detail. There has been this horizon project, Fiducio, where a systematic approach was laid out um, to identify the main sources of uncertainties like the surface albedo or the aerosol optical properties, which I assumed in some cases, and then do a calculation for every pixel of all these um, components. And if you want to then transfer this to aggregated gridded products, you need to also know the correlation structures and you need to have a good characterization of the input of the level one data so that you can do this. After having calculated on a pixel level such an uncertainty, which is a, a width of a Gaussian distribution um, of errors that are to be expected for each individual pixel, you can then compare 
error distributions based on those uncertainties in blue with the error distributions versus error in um, red. And you can even use this to optimize these uncertainties if you find any differences. And finally, you, you can also look into such plots where you see on the x-axis the expected discrepancy um, and on the y-axis the absolute error, both in terms of statistical quantities, um, so the 38, 68, or 95 percentiles, and these lines should lie on the dotted curves, which are the theoretical assumption behind Gaussian and error distributions, and they should at least have continuous growth to the right, so that you can really see pixel level uncertainty will help to separate good and weak pixels. So this kind of information in the data sets for every pixel, who is it useful for? It is, for example, useful for data assimilation, better than having a bulk and uncertainty information. And you see here in, in a study with the MAC model where MODIS and, and AATSR were assimilated, where only AATSR with pixel level uncertainties on the top right, and which um, had the best agreement with statistical agreement with um, error rate vectors. Also, this, what I mentioned before, ensemble products, where you combine individual algorithms which each have their strengths and weaknesses to a best of all. If you can use these uncertainties as weighting, then you get um, a, da a combined data product that has better coverage and at least equal quality to any of the individual algorithms. You see here in the lower part, the, the most left um, one is the ensemble, and the greener the color, the better in this um, score that we have calculated here. So in the end, validation, which means after the retrieval comparison to a reference like the error and some photometer measurements, and uncertainty, which is at the time of the retrieval predicting error distributions, they need to be compared. And this is done in the lower part here, that the, value, I mean, the slides I showed before, that the um, statistical agreement of the errors measured versus error net and the errors predicted with the uncertainty in the products, that they agree. So they are, you can see this as two sides of the same coin. But it's of course, if you have this uncertainty in the product, then the user can already start to work with this information when he uses the data. Finally, I have the point of consistency. So when we have independent products, what I mentioned from independent sensors, which have their information piece, like Yasi is carrying only information on mineral dust, maybe. Um, the dual view instruments like SLISTER or AATSR carry information on the total aerosol optic depth and the fine mode. And then if you try to add up the components. So in red here, you have the dust from Yasi. In blue, you have the fine mode from dual view ensemble algorithm. They should add up to the total LED, which also comes here from the dual view in black. And in purple is the sum of the components. And there is another element, as I mentioned earlier on already, which is seesaw. And this is not available from any satellite product directly. So here we used um, the TAMS model to prescribe um, the component of CSOL. And then the total sum of red, green, blue, depicted in this purple color, is very close to the black total AOD within the gray shade of the uncertainties of the total AOD. So this is a data set, a time record, global average here that is consistent, where the different instruments can be used together. And this brings me to my conclusion during my time. So I think everyone is convinced that satellite aerosol retrieval is an indispensable tool for global monitoring, especially in remote areas, but also with a structured approach equal everywhere on the globe. But I also hopefully 
give you some ideas of the challenges involved with this. And this is why we use several sensors and different algorithms which have unique capabilities and limitations. And we need validation and uncertainty characterization to quantitatively document these weaknesses and strengths of each. And yes, the synergy aspect has been mentioned when I entered this session. So I fully support this statement. Synergy of different sources, different satellite instruments, but also satellite and model satellite and LIDAR instruments um, is where we can gain more information. And with this, I leave you with the references that I have mentioned. There are many more, but to give you some idea of where you can read more detail about a few glimpses that I was able to show you in this short talk. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your comments or questions. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Uh, Maybe a question from, from my side. Uh, you uh, presented the challenges following the retrieval of uh, uh, aerosol properties from satellites. So uh, could you please make a comment about the perspectives that we have uh, uh, with uh, the METOSAT third generation satellite that is coming out in the next month? And how um, possible it would be to face some of the challenges, have better results, on, let's say, optical properties or even cloud and aerosol interactions? Well, uh, the, the expert in the room would be Oleg on this, but of course the, the 3MI instrument, which is based on the heritage of the Polder instrument, so instruments which have a, a unique combination of information, multi-angle, multi-spectral and polarization. Um, this is, of course, um, the highest information can, content by theory, so the number of independent of aerosol properties that can be expected to be successfully retrieved and have been shown with the grass algorithm, for example, and is, is the highest. Still, there are also limitations and caveats. I mean, you need also a more complicated um, description of the surface to, to do vector radiative transfer. Um, and the, the validation and the comparison that we had done between the earlier version of, of GRASP or of polar algorithms and other satellite instruments and in combination uh, validation with Aeronet showed um, it's not perfect. In, in early days, we had the intention to use the polar um, data set as a quasi Aeronet like reference which, with global coverage. And this this we did not follow up fully because acknowledging the high capabilities of um, the polarimetric information, it, it is not the same quality as Aaron. And so, so I expect a lot of improvements with this instrument, um, but nothing will be perfect. And we still need the other instruments to do climatology. So we, 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 we need to know the history. And with the weakest instruments like ABHRR, which carry very little information on aerosol, we go back to 1980 with the dual view instruments, we go back to 1995. There has been a polder for two years in the 90s. And then there is, has been polder in 2005 to 2013. So you have pieces of polarized information, but we need to combine it to get the full picture and the long records so that we see trends, that we see anomalies. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Stelius? Uh, I thought some, something maybe more basic is uh, the question about the usability of different satellites. And uh, in the literature, my, well, my opinion is that uh, the model space uh, Modest instruments are used really in a great extent compared with, uh, let's say, the OMI or Arzol or, or even ATSR. Can you comment on that? Well, um, there are many reasons why this is the case. I think Modus was the first 
quasi operational product that was also made available easily and that has a good coverage. So the, the swath width is 2,000 something kilometers. So you have every second day, you have uh, information everywhere when it's cloud free on, on the globe. Um, and there was also a, a, a large science, screen, science team built in the years before the first launch of Modus. And um, so there's, there's many reasons why this product is well established. Also Modus has seen versions and further improvements. So there were weaknesses identified, some of them were solved, some of them are still there. And there are theoretical limits that it's only multispectrum, no different viewing angles in an individual image, no polarization information. Um, so this is there. Um, Modus will have an end. It's coming coming closer because the the fuel is, is coming to an end at one point. Um, it has a successor instrument, VIRS, which is even officially more operational, um, but it's not exactly the same instrument. Even the two MODIS instruments um, on the two platforms, Terra and Aqua, have slight differences um, in, in their calibration. So um, building a time record from these pieces is um, a difficult task that we will have to iterate and then improve step by step again and again. I see there are comments from Sarah in the chat. Yes, there, there, is. there is a comment from, from Sarah. Uh, may I put it to the public too? What about the sensibility of the satellite sensors to ground levels? Uh, I mean, it we, yeah, maybe it can be discussed also. Uh, Directly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was curious because you, you are going to these multi sensor synergistic approaches, then for model evaluation we realize that there are some sensors that are more sensible to 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 catch the surface levels than others. And for example, Yas is a good example that in Bodele it looks like it's is more blind to the first layer, first meters of the of the ground than other sensors. Then, how you can you know how you can balance information coming from a sensor like Modis that looks like is more deeper, uh, the signal is more deeper than than IASI, for example. Um, very challenging task. Um, there's, I think that the perfect solution will be. Um, a data assimilation system or a digital twin. But this means a lot of work to characterize the error structures for each of the products. And in, in the past, UABSC or ECMWF, there were limitations how many, for how many satellites you can do this effort. And therefore, it's not that all the satellites are assimilated. Um, then there is also intrinsic limitations. So what you want, for example, is combine everything at one reference wavelength, 550 nanometer as the usual um, one that you choose. And this means MODIS has direct measurements and at 440, 670 um, are mainly used for aerosol retrieval. And then it's easy to get 550. For YASI, you work at 10 or 11 micron. And then you have to do a conversion, which depends on the composition of the dust. And either you take an assumption or you, you get some additional information out of the YASI data to make a choice which conversion factor you apply, so which com composition you assume, fitting different spectra. But there is an uncertainty in this. And the part of um, absorbing by hematite in the visible is not visible at all in the thermal. So you will miss it. So these, these are other limitations which make a combination of products, although they are all named dust AOD at 550 nanometer, um, a challenging task. Great.
next speaker is uh, yeah, you're welcome. Is uh, Thanos Nenes uh, from EPFL, uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, we have the uh, opportunity to have Thanos here uh, uh, live at uh, the auditorium since he's uh, at Patras. Oh, will, will, you should give us a couple of minutes to to set up the presentation. Meanwhile, I will, I will put, say a few words about uh, about Thanos. So, uh, Thanos Nenos uh, took his uh, diploma in uh, chemical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens and uh, his uh, MSc in atmospheric chemistry at the University of Miami. Then, uh, for his PhD in, in uh, chemical engineering, he was in uh, the California Institute of Technology and after Georgia Tech and more, many years of work, he's at the Laboratory of Atmospheric Processes and the Impacts, impacts sorry, at uh, EFFL Lausanne. If I can say, if I can summarize some of his research interest, it's about aerosol and cloud interaction, laboratory work, field work, modeling, and also modeling of uh, anthropogenic impact on regional and global climate. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to talk... Uh, Thanos, you, may, you may open your camera also at the, at, the, uh, at the laptop in order to be seen at, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the Zoom. Okay. It says that I'm muted. Is that okay? Uh, Stelius, can you hear Thanos? Just give us a second. Um, Okay, now I can see you. It's, you are not George Cosmopoulos. George is our <laughs> my colleague that he's running around me. It's my alias. <laughs> all the morning. It's uh, my al alias, right. Okay. So, again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to talk about aerosol composition and its effects. Just a second. Just to, to say, uh, to check in if it's... it's Yes. No, no, you, you should open your, your mic at the, at, the, at the laptop as well, because they cannot, they cannot hear you for the Zoom. Can you open up the microphone at the laptop? This is not enough. <laughs> Just give us a second. It's too hybrid now. <laughs> I can uh, join in from the, the cell phone. That sometimes works. Okay, from Zoom, you, are, you, you can hear you fine. Okay, everything is fine? Okay, so I can start. Yeah, I can, I can, I can say that you're okay with okay. Zoom. You can hear, we are here, I suppose also in YouTube. So please, apologies for... <laughs> no, no, my apologies uh, for being here in person, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, just, just something, sorry, we need one more step to share his presentation too. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the last step. Guys, we need to share his presentation. It says it's okay. okay. Yeah, I cannot see it, hear it, uh, check it, see it on Zoom. Ah, so you're controlling my computer, I see. Okay, let me just go ahead. It says host enabled. We still have a few more uh, technical difficulties. Sorry, people online. I can say that I've been 15 years at Georgia Tech, yes. and then I've been for yeah. another four years now at EPFL. Good host. And so I actually spent about uh, some time in Greece systematically. So I'm also affiliated with a fourth the Foundation for Research and Technology here in Patras. So it's actually a lot of fun to be able to interact between Switzerland and Greece all the time. And uh, I will be honest in saying that uh, it's probably one of the most exciting periods of my life. You know, after going through all the stuff with the U.S., actually here we get to do a lot of things uh, that uh, have to do with aerosol impacts, chemistry impacts, and we'll talk about some of that here. So hopefully you can get some of the excitement. And if you're interested, maybe we can explore some things together, at least help guide you on some topics or projects of relevance. Okay. Yeah. All right. So after that, hopefully we can start now. Hopefully everybody hears me online. And uh, let me just check the chat to make sure that there are no questions. Okay, good. All right. So I'm going to focus on aerosol chemical composition and effects. 
There are a lot of talks here about aerosol cloud interactions. I will touch upon them very briefly. But I mean, you know, there's going to be a lot more topics covered in that regard. So I'm going to focus on the other things that have to do with composition as well. So I will mention aerosol cloud interactions, but I will also focus on health and ecosystems, simply because it's really cool and important research. So of course we talk about particles and sizes, and most of the things that we deal with have to do with particles that are below two and a half microns. Of course, 10 microns are things that are related to dust, so that also has important impacts. But more or less, these are the kinds of uh, particle sizes we're talking about. And of course, we recognize there are many sources of particulate matter, and there are many transformations occurring. So when we talk about chemical composition, we're really mentioning a vast complexity. So you know, remote sensing can give you some idea about certain things, like when it comes to size and amount. But uh, insights into the chemical complexity, we have a really long way to go. And most of the insights we get are actually from in situ measurements. Especially because you have emissions, but then you know aerosols change a lot on the way. You have nucleation and growth. We have chemical reactions, condensation, processing through clouds, and eventually rain off. And all the impacts have to do with many of these steps. Especially when we talk about interactions with clouds, aerosols are very important. But also the rain out, the deposition, has itself some profound impacts, especially when we talk about ecosystems. And then the stuff that's in the air, of course, affects us when it comes to health. And again, if you look at the observations, this is just looking at built properties, like how much sulfate and nitrate you have, how much black carbon and uh, organic aerosol. Just looking at bulk observations, you have huge uh, variability in terms of the amount, but also the chemical composition. And of course, in each of those classes, you have thousands of compounds when it comes to organics. And you know, organics is a soup, changes a lot throughout its lifetime. And its impacts really depend on the kind of question you're asking. And if you get into health, actually, the composition can have a real profound impact. When it comes to cloud development, the composition also is important. And uh, if you're interested in things like ice clouds, you need to be able to get the dust and the state of the dust right to get ice nuclei predictions, or also consider things like bioaerosol and pollen and bacteria. And that means, again, vast complexity that you need to carry out. But again, why do we care about aerosols? They reflect and absorb sunlight, and of course, they directly affect the climate. We've all seen pictures here with fires. Uh, this is back in 2007, you know, some very important fires at the time in the Peloponnese, where the whole Mediterranean white became white, and that essentially meant that you had a local cooling, simply because there was no radiation reaching the ground. But then, of course, you can have components in the aerosol that absorb light, and so black carbon, of course, is very important in that regard. You also have brown carbon. These are compounds that absorb light close to the UV, and so that also affects uh, the amount of energy that reaches the ground or the energy distribution, as well as photochemistry, because those photons that get absorbed usually activate chemistry, so that's pretty interesting. And of course, we care a lot about clouds because they have an important radiative impact. They're responsible for about 30% of the albedo, of the planetary albedo in the short wave but also they have a very important impact when it comes to hydrology, right? The hydrological impact, the precipitation. So this means water resources and impacts, of course, on society. So any kind of change, perturbation you have on the distribution of clouds can have, of course, profound impacts on pretty much anything that we do, and ecosystems included. Now, when we talk about aerosol cloud interactions, of course, we're talking about the ability of particles to act as seeds for forming cloud droplets in ice. And uh, if you look at liquid clouds, some of the particles, which we call cloud condensation nuclei, form droplets. And the idea is that if you have polluted regions, you have more particles, so the clouds tend to form uh, more droplets. That means that the clouds become brighter because the clouds have a lot more surface area for reflectivity. At the same time, the microphysical state of the clouds change, so the droplet size, and that means things like collision coalescence and precipitation get profoundly changed as well. They could actually have a big impact. And because of that, we say that aerosols affect precipitation. And this is just for liquid clouds. For ice clouds, you can have also many other types of interactions that lead to feedbacks, which we will quickly mention. But uh, you know, Nico Nicolas Belluin, who will follow up, basically will have a lot more to say about that. But it's really important to point out that anywhere you look where you have clouds and particles, you always see changes in the cloud properties. So this is an example where anthropogenic emissions can have an important impact on clouds. 
This is from a classical paper that was published in Science more than a decade ago, but it really shows very clearly how emissions from power plants, from refineries, ports, when they get incorporated into clouds, actually affect the, the reflectivity of clouds, the ability to reflect sunlight back into space, the albedo. And the white colored areas are the more reflective parts of the clouds. And this is just because the particles get incorporated into the cloud decks, the clouds are close to ground. And then you have more droplets that basically make the clouds whiter. And these are often uh, called uh, basically um, uh, power plant tracks or pollution tracks. Uh, you know, they're different uh, terms coined in the, in the literature on that. And because of all these important changes, we know that the cool climate, anything that tends to make the clouds whiter, especially those close to ground, tend to things, make things uh, cooler. And that tends to have a net cooling effect on climate. But of course, the uncertainty behind it is very large for a lot of reasons. But it's not just about anthropogenic aerosol. It's also about all the, all the other kinds of aerosol. So this is, again, a paper that's been published a long time ago where in the southern oceans you have this persistent emission of compounds from phytoplankton that oxidize and form sulfate. And those sulfate aerosols tend to make the droplets in clouds much smaller and they tend to make the clouds more whiter. And actually you have a seasonal cycle of, of cooling that corresponds with the uh, uh, appearance of phytoplankton. This uh, map here shows the amount of phytoplankton in the ocean as a function of season. And it turns out that this cooling is very important regionally and has a climate impact. And it's just a biological response. It's the biosphere affecting clouds. Same thing occurs with volcanoes. Volcanoes, uh, this is a region in the Southern Ocean called the Sandwich Islands. You have persistent emissions of uh, sulfur dioxide that gets oxidized and forms particles. And then the clouds in that region, you can see this is the picture in the visible. The clouds look white. But if you look at the radiative effects, the volcanic plumes make the clouds much whiter. So you have huge amounts of particles being emitted and transformed from all kinds of sources, and all these things together actually affect clouds. There's another thing here. Not all clouds cool climate, so if you affect them, you actually may lead to uh, situations where you're warming climate. Typically, when you modify clouds and make them white or close to ground, the, the visible effect that clouds have to reflect sunlight always wins over, so to speak. But if you affect clouds that are high up in the atmosphere, cirrus clouds that are pure ice, if you make more of them around, they actually allow sunlight to go through, but the infrared is partially blocked. So effectively, you make climate warmer if you increase clouds in those altitudes, or make them, you know, microphysically with smaller crystals, make them more persistent. Somewhere in between, when you talk about the, in the intermediate altitudes, radiatively those clouds are, tend to be neutral, meaning that any warming is canceled by any cooling that you get on average. But here these clouds also change a lot because they may uh, be affected in their chances of precipitation. And again, because of that, you may have a large impact on climate simply because you distribute uh, clouds in a different way, so they in turn may interact with radiation in a different way. So, in other words, anything that has to do with clouds means it's quite uncertain. And then if you're trying to deal with aerosols and clouds, of course, that's a lot of uncertainty. But we still try to work on it for decades simply because it's the largest cooling effect that uh, it has on climate when it comes to anthropogenic activities. Almost everything else that we do leads to warming. Of course, greenhouse gases, we know that. And, uh, but the aerosol effects tend to induce a cooling and that kind of masks some of the warming that we felt over the last century. And uh, the uncertainty between, behind these aerosols and aerosol cloud interactions actually mask our uncertainty in terms of, uh, sorry, mask the ability to predict the warming in the future a lot. So at least for the next decades, we really have to be able to constrain much better how aerosols interacts with clouds and climate if we want to be able to say that we'll project the future with some kind of a certainty, more than at least we have right now. But there are other reasons why we care about aerosols, and I'm going to talk uh, you know, for the rest of the time on that. First of all, they kill you, all right? Simply put, outside we have a wonderful celebration of the graduation going on. Those online don't see it, but it's really nice. But they also use uh, things that emit particles, and you breathe them in, and it smells like gunpowder, and you're like, hmm, it's kind of bad for you. Generally speaking, anytime you have a lot of particles around, they tend to have a large impact on your health. 
And there are many reasons for that. Actually, it's one of the major killers worldwide when it comes to uh, premature death. It's a COVID pandemic every year happens just because of exposure to air pollution. The World Health Organization estimates that about 4 million or more die prematurely because of exposure to ambient pollution. And this doesn't consider possible effects of exposure to indoor air pollution that we have many sources for. Pollutants with the strongest evidence of public health concern has to do with just the stuff you breathe, the mass of particles. That's sort of the most important signal that you get epidemiology-wise. Uh, but also you have ozone, nitrous oxide, all those things actually are associated with premature death. And bad health. And actually when it comes to, again, the global uh, you know, um, burden of disease, studies always point out that in the top five, you have particulate matter being a cause of premature death. You know, on the top, you have high blood pressure, smoking, you know, we eat too much, we have high cholesterol that causes death, we know that. But also breathing stuff associated with burning or even just being outside. If there's for any reason a dust event, any reason there's just a lot of particles around, even from natural sources, that's associated with premature death. So it's actually not good for you, no matter what. And if it comes to Europe, you know, often we have the question, well, that usually is associated with places that have a lot of pollution, like China, right? Well, no, actually, in Europe, we have a lot of premature death, too, as well. We just don't recognize it. About 790,000 excess deaths per year in Europe. That's a lot, right? A lot of that's associated with things like biomass burning, you know, burning uh, in wood in homes for just because we like the fireplace, it's cool, you know, it gives nice ambience but it generates a lot of smoke that ends up really causing harm to us. And so being able to actually understand in the end what's really causing the premature death is one of the holy grails of the topic of aerosols and health impacts. And going back to that picture of uh, compositional complexity, one thing is for sure, particulate mass, which is used as a metric of uh, impacts of uh, particles exposure to, uh, on health, is clearly not enough. There's stuff in the particles that cause the impacts, right? For example, sea salt, sodium chloride, if you breathe a lot of it in particles, it usually doesn't cause you any harm. You can have huge amounts of it around. But then if you breathe the same amount of mass of smoke, you, re you can even have a heart attack. So there's clearly differences that are linked to chemical composition. And we need to do much better, much more research to understand those links, because then that helps understand what we need to control if we want to mitigate air pollution impacts. So one of the leading hypotheses is that actually what you breathe, what causes the harm in the end is something that causes oxidative stress throughout your body. And there are good reasons for that because you know at every cell in our body, we always generate free radicals. That's part of metabolism. That's how we get the energy to live. Now, these free radicals, if they float around, they actually cause a lot of damage to all the cells. They oxidize DNA, lipids, cells actually die. So our cells always have a mechanism of coping with that. They have antioxidants everywhere. So if there is any free radical that's floating around where it shouldn't be, it automatically gets neutralized with antioxidants, like ascorbic acid, vitamin C. But, you know, that's usually okay. We, we're in a good metabolic state, our body generates enough antioxidants to be able to withstand any kind of free radicals that are straying away from the mitochondria that cause, that are energy sort of generators in the body. But if you breathe stuff that cause additional free radicals to be generated throughout the body, then what could happen is that your body is overwhelmed with free radicals and the antioxidants that it has are not sufficient to neutralize what's around. So this is what we think is going on. You're breathing particles, they have stuff that generate free radicals that on top of what you need to have to live cause systemic oxidative stress, which means inflammation. And it turns out that a lot of the, the, the bad health effects that we see associated with particle exposure have to do exactly with inflammatory diseases. So for example, heart attacks, hypertension, brain problems, strokes, Parkinson's, they're all associated with air pollution exposure, even obesity, premature aging, you know, your skin becoming old before it should, uh, your liver damage, uh, all kinds of blood diseases. They're all associated with oxidative stress, and this is linked to excessive um, free radicals that may be generated from exposure to air pollution. 
So right now, the community, what they're doing is they're trying to link essentially what might be inside these particles to things that we know cause oxidative stress. So for example, you can have metals like copper and iron. Those are really toxic. There are tons of it around, from car brakes, you name it, inside of cities, or from dust. All these things actually may cause oxidative stress. Even polycyc polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are associated with quinones that generate a lot of free radicals, biomass burning is very rich in that, diesel, all that stuff. And so actually right now we have ways of measuring the oxidative potential using a number of assays. And the idea is that we try to use these assays, link them to, to particle levels that are either measured in the ambient or in sources, and try to essentially generate a way to quantify the toxicity of particles using something that we know will cause bad health effects for us. So for example, if you use uh, what's known as oxidative potential as a metric of toxicity, automatically you can see that particles from trees are not very toxic. Particles from biomass burning are huge, hugely toxic. And so there are many other sources, cooking particles, oxidize. Generally speaking, when you oxidize something, that tends to generate more of its ability to make free radicals, and that causes oxidative stress. And we also are noting that in addition to oxidative stress, you may have a lot of other compounds that cause things like cancer, right? There are many types of toxicity. It's not just about inflammation in the body. You also may generate cancers. And certain aerosol types are known to be very rich in carcinogens, and biomass burning is a very important source. And people that live in you know, Greece or in any basically urban city nowadays, especially throughout Europe, every winter get exposed to a lot of smoke from biomass burning. And it turns out that some pollution episodes, for example in Athens, just two or three of them are responsible for almost half the annual exposure to carcinogens. So we have to be very careful and basically say that we need to eradicate this kind of source. But we also mentioned metals. So there are a lot of metals in particles. You have iron, copper, manganese, and other transition metals. And it turns out that when those metals get exposed to acidity, they become soluble. And that soluble stuff also causes a lot of oxidative stress. And this is just uh, some um, measurements that we took place. Uh, this is published a few years ago, where depending on the pH of the particles, you have no solubilization of metals or a lot of solubilization. And it turns out that this soluble fraction which can be a lot because throughout the world we have very acidic particles. This is just a map showing what the pH of particles are like. Particles that you breathe here in, in Greece can be as acidic as stomach acid. In the southeast US, they could be acidic as battery acid in the car. It's really acidic. And what this acid does, it solubilizes the metals. Whenever you have acidic compounds overlapping with metals in the same particle, they become soluble. And it turns out that this solubilization is associated with the oxidative stress to a large degree of particles. So may, this actually may re explain why sulfate in the ambient atmosphere is associated with toxicity, because it induces acidity that if you have particles around that have metals, they become soluble, and when you breathe them, they cause oxidative stress, and then all things like heart attacks, strokes, you name it, right? And cars are a huge source of metallic particles because of the brakes, uh, whenever you press your brake in your car, you generate a lot of particles that then get stuck on dust. That mixes with pollution, and eventually you breathe it. And we breathe it throughout our lifetime in the cities. So this is actually a really interesting finding, and it's important. And it's also been shown that throughout of Europe, actually, metals are associated, again, with adverse health impacts. And this is probably the mechanism behind it. But also particles affect ecosystem. The same stuff that may kill us actually may be nutrients for things like phytoplankton. I mentioned soluble iron being in a, a toxin for us. Well, iron is important for phytoplankton to, for photosynthesis. And it turns out that if you supply soluble iron to ecosystems, you actually may fertilize it. And so again, particles have impacts, and the same mechanisms have a lot of implications also about uh, ecosystems, and of course this means the carbon cycle. And so, you know, particles can be very rich in things like iron and phosphorus, which are very important nutrients. They can supply nitrogen. And, you know, if you have uh, a region of the world, like over the oceans, that is limited in these nutrients, they can be delivered by the atmosphere, they deposit, and all of a sudden you might have a bloom, a phytoplankton bloom, and then all of a sudden productivity. 
food is produced and fish start flourishing, it's actually incredible. The, the food chain actually gets affected quite a bit. And so the idea is that this is what aerosols can do, chemical composition, acidity, and aerosol type. And these are things that we only now are starting to realize. And of course, the implications are very important, from climate all the way to ecosystem productivity. Just want to show you here that we've done measurements in Crete. This is in the site of Finocalia, where again we take the dust. Sometimes it's mixed with a lot of pollution, so it becomes acidic, and then the phosphorus becomes very soluble and bioavailable. Sometimes it's not. You have a lot of dust and not a lot of pollution, so the phosphorus is less bioavailable. And so you can actually see acidification effects and how aerosol pollution interactions can lead to a bloom. And I mentioned that if you have this thing deposited in the ocean, it actually may cause a phytoplankton bloom. And uh, this is actually shown here in this graph. This is a study, again, that was done a long time ago, but actually there have been subsequent studies ever since showing that this is really going on. Dust, if it deposits in certain areas of the ocean, supplies iron, and theoretically it can actually cause fertilization, a bloom of phytoplankton. And you can see that from the satellite, it lights up as green. And it turns out that sometimes you have a lot of dust falling into these regions that need iron, and there's nothing that appears. You get huge amounts of dust that just fall in the ocean, no response. But then if that dust actually comes through a polluted region, it takes up the acids, it solubilizes the metals, and only then if it rains out you see a bloom. And this is remarkable. This is how pollution, when it interacts with a natural sort of source like dust, can actually have a huge impact on an ecosystem. And so this bloom, you know, it happens, it's one episode, it stays for 20 days or so, it goes away, but then you have another dust plume, another dust plume, another dust plume, and eventually you end up supplying a lot of uh, fertilization into the oceans. And we think, you know, this is again stuff that's been published a few years ago, that this excess fertilization, if it gets transported through ocean currents into other regions of the world, can actually lead to things even like decrease of oxygen content in, in the remote oceans. So uh, if, you know, there's been studies for the last decade showing that the oxygen in things like the tropics is going down in the oceans. And that's important because without oxygen, of course, we don't have, you know, the, the food chain or the life chain as we think. The, the, the ocean becomes anoxic. And actually, if it becomes anoxic, it starts producing greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide at very large rates. So this is actually something that we really care about. And it turns out that anthropogenic pollution, iron that's released because of the interaction of dust with pollution, may transport this excess stuff in regions of the ocean and make them anoxic because you generate a lot of phytoplankton. And when that phytoplankton dies, bacteria eats it up and consumes the oxygen that exists. So this is actually quite important. Finally, when you talk about nitrogen, acidity is very important. And so depending if your atmosphere is very acidic or not, the nitrogen emissions may deposit locally or get transported over long distances. And again, this is something that's important because we know that uh, pollution is an important source of nitrogen. Finally, there are all kinds of particle types that we're only now, now starting to understand, uh, quantify and realize their impacts. Bioaerosols are a very important type. In indoors, we talk about viruses. In outdoors, we talk about pollen, fungi, and bacteria. And we care about them because they can also affect clouds, but they also can be a very important source of nutrients for ecosystems again. Bacteria is very rich in, in phosphorus, and actually recent work showing is that they may be more important than dust, which is a completely new concept that changes what we think is going on in the atmosphere. So with that, you know, I'd like to thank you for your time. Just like to point out that we work on all these topics, both at EPFL as well as the center that we have here in Greece with uh, Professor Spandis and Kanakidu. And the idea is that we really try to see how aerosols are impacting air quality, clouds, climate, and ecosystems. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Ah, thank you, Stelio. Uh, I don't know if someone there in the audience has some questions for you. Any questions? No questions. Okay, we have if a question. There are any, if there are no questions, I will make one question to Thanos, if I may. Okay, Vasily. Sure, Thanos, go ahead. 
I wanted to to make this question to you when we're in person, but let's let's have this question online so everybody will hear your opinion. Your opinion about absorption panels. You worked a lot with smoke, and what is the climate impact in general? In general, in your opinion, as how you feel it, how important it is. So I think when it comes to absorption. It's, if you look at the numbers, it tends to be relatively small compared to other things that force climate. But what's interesting about absorption is that if you look at the upper levels of the atmosphere, the absorption becomes more efficient because especially if you have things like brown carbon, the photons are absorbed more efficiently higher up. So I think what absorption does, it actually induces a differential heating that you wouldn't have otherwise, and that has implications for dynamics. Now, the problem is that we don't know it so well, so depending on the model you have, you might have a different response. But I think actually absorption is an important component that needs to be constrained exactly because of that. It causes differential heating, not just uniform heating. And that, of course, affects things. Thanks, Thanos. Thank you. So we had a question from the audience as well. Uh, you talked about like uh, certain metals and pollutants that uh, come from us that uh, are uh, helpful towards uh, environments or certain ecosystems that are created in the ocean. Uh, but do you have like any correlation with the actual pollutants that are in the sea or in the environment itself before the creation of uh, new ecosystems? Like, do you have any correlation or maybe analogy uh, in a graph that okay we create something but where it is created is already polluted enough to be instantly destroyed? Like, what are the rates that our creation is also something that destroys it? Right, so when it comes to things like the metals, um, that's emitted locally and they could get, get transported over long distances over a few days. So they're certainly not destroyed fast enough to say that they remain locally and they don't get transported globally. That's for sure. Now, what's also interesting is that as it ages, its effect increases. Like the soluble fraction of metals increases with time. It doesn't go automatically 100%, and then if you deposit it, you lose it. So aerosols last long enough that they can transport throughout the world in a week, depending on where they are. And most of them are small enough to stay long enough to be transported. So, and that's why we think that their impacts can be global, especially over long time scales where you accumulate slowly over time. So, you know, one graph that shows that effect is what we said, showed here with the oxygen content, where something that was deposited in the North Pacific over 50 years gets transported to the tropics and then affects the primary productivity there. Uh, but um, what was created in the North Pacific, how long is it going to stay, like, after the metals moved on? like the environment that's been affected and the ecosystem that's been created after the metals moved on, how long is it going to survive on its own without the nutrients, unless new metals also come along in the same space? So that has to do with the overturned time scale of the surface ocean, Makes which sense. is on the order of a few years. So if you don't supply anything else, that effect will just be there for a few weeks and then it goes away. But you never have something that just happens once in the atmosphere, you have episodes and it goes again and again and again. So over the course of a year, you have almost continuous deposition. So it's, I would say it's a continuous impact. Unless if you do something to stop the emissions of pollution. You can't stop dust emissions, but at least pollution you can. And that would be things that would reverse this impact. So theoretically, we can say that it's been like an incline and not a decline in the positive aspects? Yeah, it's increasing. It and okay. we didn't know about it, actually. We don't know really, and we're only starting to see these effects. And so, to be honest, I think uh, the impact that we have on the environment through these processes is going up, it's not going down. The only t uh, time we expect things to really start going down is if we globally reduce the emissions of things that are acidic pollution. So in some regions of the world, there has been controls, but in some other regions of the world, it's not. It's still quite high, and so, so we don't want to actually change the emissions for now, but we also want to like decrease health issues. We can like we need different we different. Like, different yeah, that's that's the big problem. You know, one thing causes quote unquote good, 
and then it also causes harm. So soluble iron is good if you want the oceans to fertilize and take up carbon, but then you, if you breathe it, it kills you or damages you. So what do you pick? I mean, it's, it's a really hard answer, but that's the, the, the really interesting aspects, but also the difficult thing, that one process, stuff that happens, has multiple impacts that are perceived as positive or negative. So that's, that's the problem of policy. How do you figure out emissions in a way that sort of minimizes all the damages and maximizes the benefits? <laughs> Some might say, like, there are a lot of humans. <laughs> there are not a lot of plankton. <laughs> <laughs> we should save humans and not worry about plankton? <laughs> yes, other questions? Okay, thank you everybody, thank and you thank you those much. online. Uh, there was one question. What about examples and uh, changes in land? Is that old? Okay, yes, there is one question on land. Uh, it's from Sarah. What about changes in land? For example, the fires increase in sleep with increase of mineral gas. Sarah, you can just uh, directly ask if you want to be more specific. No. Uh, it, it was basically that is 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 a reinforced effect, right? The climate change will favor fires. This means that there will be reduced vegetation, meaning that probably there will be more areas considered as arid, and probably there will be more dust then it's not just human, uh, human activities, right? Absolutely. I mean, and that's the, ch that's the difficulty of attributing climate change to human activities. There are all these other things going on at the same time. And you, you mentioned wildfires. Also, wildfires themselves produce dust, right? Because you have these strong currents, uh, wind-driven yeah, exactly. dust. So uh, incorporating all that is what you need to do to really understand better the, the long-term impacts of all these events. But uh, you're right. You just need to have the full system in these models and try to uh, understand how everything responds. That's the difficulty. But uh, we're trying, right, as a community. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. It was super nice, Thanks. Way. Thanks. Okay, so Andrea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Panos. All right. And we go to the last speaker for the day. Uh, Nicolas, are you here? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm here. And last speaker is Nicolas de Luc Boulin. He's Professor of Climate Processes at the University of Reading in the UK and chairing the Aviation and Climate at Sorbonne University, Paris, France. He obtained his PhD on aerosol stabilizing and sensing from the University of Leeds and then worked at the UK Met Office for model, modeling on aerosols and then aviation effects in the UK climate before joining the University of Reading. He has co led the latest community assessment of aerosol radiative forcing of climate change. It was published by the NSO 2020 in the Review of Geophysics, and he has been leading, he is, he is a leading author of the latest geophysics position report of the IPCC. Uh, Nicolas, thank you very much for uh, all your time and for this talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stelios, and um, and thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to uh, to talk today about. Uh, Aerosol effects on uh, on climate. Um, so uh, so I'm not going to present uh, just my work. Of course, there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people who contributed to uh, to this uh, sum of knowledge that uh, I will summarize today. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's been clear from uh, from all the presentations today that aerosols do a lot of things when they are in in the atmosphere. Uh, we've seen that, uh, that they, they, they scatter and absorb uh, radiation, they interact with, with clouds, they, they change the cloud droplet number, that's the, the Tumi effect, and then that has consequences on, on the evolution of the cloud and, uh, and its ability to, to form rain. 
there are also impacts on 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 conviction uh, yeah, aerosols may invigorate uh, conviction by changing the distribution of uh, of uh, of uh, of, of water in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the clouds, uh, and there are also a class of uh, impacts on ice clouds that is perhaps less uh, less well known. Um, there are also impacts uh, from uh, from uh, from changes to uh, surface albedo via deposition of um, absorbing aerosols like mineral dust and uh, and black carbon. And imp importantly, of course, uh, the aerosols always did that. They, they are part of, uh, of the natural uh, climate system. And in, in the pre initial atmosphere, you had all those, uh, all those uh, uh, mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, but what, what we've done, uh, uh, we uh, humans, uh, is that we increase the amount of aerosols that have been emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, and that change from uh, a pre-industrial reference to uh, to the present day means that uh, aerosols have uh, affected climate. So, one way to uh, to to, uh, to measure this uh, climate impact is through the concept of uh, relative forcing. So, relative forcing is uh, the change in top of atmosphere radiation due to a change. In something that is external to the climate system, so it could be uh, it could be uh, CO2 um, concentrations, uh, aerosols, ozone, but also things like volcanic eruptions and uh, and the change in, in in solar irradiance, for example, are also source of relative force. So for aerosols, there's a lot of complexity, as we've just seen. Uh, they do a lot of things. So. Uh, Things are now separated between what we call aerosol radiation interaction, ARI, and aerosol cloud interaction, ACI. So aerosol radiation interactions, so we've seen that uh, already. So when you add aerosols, they uh, scatter and absorb radiation, so you may change the amount of radiation that, uh, that is uh, uh, scattered back to space. Uh, but then uh, the atmosphere will will react to the change in distribution of, uh, of relative fluxes and that will impact uh, the temperature profile and the humidity profile and you can change uh, 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 cloud formation uh, through uh, what is called uh, rapid adjustments to uh, aerosol radiation interactions. For aerosol cloud interactions, uh, so we've seen the Tumi effect, where you change the cloud albedo of the cloud by changing the uh, cloud droplet number. Uh, and then uh, there, are, there is a host a cascade of, uh, of changes in, in the clouds that may affect uh, cloud ability to, to expand vertically or horizontally, uh, and also the ability to precipitate, and all that is included in what's so-called rapid adjustment to uh, aerosol cloud interactions. Um, and uh, that brings us to, to the concept of, uh, of uh, relative forcing and effective relative forcing. Um, so when you do an instantaneous change in aerosol in the atmosphere, you to change the uh, relative fluxes, uh, but the atmosphere doesn't have the time to respond uh, to that change, and that's what we call the instantaneous relative forcing. The stratosphere adjusts to this change because it is um, relatively coupled uh, to, uh, to the troposphere. Uh, and so, for example, if you think this is the uh, temperature profile here, uh, you may uh, change the temperature profile of the stratosphere by changing the distribution of fluxes in the troposphere. And then the troposphere will also uh, respond. We've seen the cloud will respond, the humidity will respond, the temperature will respond to the aerosol forcing. Uh, and then their profiles will also change. And so in effect, uh, the uh, climate system, and especially the ocean, which is a slow component of the climate system, does not see your initial relative forcing, so this is here in blue, but it will, in fact, uh, see the effective relative forcing, the sum of instantaneous and rapid adjustment. And from there, the uh, climate system will respond. Uh, here it's re represented as a linear change, but it's more complex than that. 
but it will respond to the essentially bring the relative balance to zero and uh, by changes, changing the uh, surface temperature. And from that, a host of changes will, will happen. So here is the uh, most recent reconstruction of, uh, of the uh, temperature attribution uh, since 1750. And this is the observed temperature change. This is what we call climate change in a, in a way. This is global warming here in, in black. And you see that, in fact, it is a, a result of a tug of war between warming from uh, greenhouse gases, uh, especially CO2 here in, in purple, and a cooling from the aerosols. The aerosol relative forcing is, uh, is negative on the global, uh, global scale, so that means that, we're, uh, that's, uh, means that uh, we are losing energy and the uh, system cools. And you see that uh, without the aerosols, we would have uh, experienced uh, a larger warming uh, from, uh, from greenhouse gases than what we experienced. Of course, that doesn't mean that uh, CO2 is, uh, is bad and aerosols are, are good. Uh, as, uh, as Thanos just said, aerosols have uh, uh, very, uh, very bad uh, health effects, so there's no, there are no questions that uh, we, should, we need to reduce uh, aerosols uh, as well. So the aerosol relative forcing is, uh, is negative on the, on the global average, uh, but it's very uncertain. So that's the uh, latest uh, estimates from, uh, from the uh, uh, sixth assessment report of the IPCC with uh, the effective relative forcing of aerosol radiation interaction at minus 0.2 watts and the uh, effective relative forcing of aerosol cladding interaction at minus 0.8 watts. Um, and if the relative forcing of the aerosol is at, uh, at the stronger end of, 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 the, uh, of the scale, so it's, uh, 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 if it is as, uh, as negative as is uh, possible from uncertainties, then uh, there is a risk that the climate sensitivity is, is larger than we think, uh, that uh, global warming will accelerate, accelerate more than we think when uh, uh, air quality improves, I should say as quality improves. Uh, and also that the uh, net carbon emissions that, uh, that we are allowed to stay under a given temperature target are smaller than, than we expect. So aerosols are uncertain, but we also, it's also good to look back and see all the progress we've made uh, over the past 40 years, when I say we, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the scientific community. Um, and uh, here is a distribution of the total aerosol optical depth that is, was imagined uh, back in the 1980s. And you see that uh, they were mostly concerned about mineral dust around the Sahara, maybe a little bit of, uh, of pollution over, uh, over the US here. Uh, but of course, you know, they didn't have the satellite aerosol products that we have now. So their knowledge of the uh, global distribution was very incomplete. And this is what we have now. Here is, this is a reanalysis of uh, uh, aerosol um, uh, 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 of uh, aerosol optical depth. So it's uh, a mixture of model and, uh, and satellite data. And you see that uh, uh, our knowledge of, uh, of the distribution have, have improved a lot. And uh, there have been many months now that we, we now know the aerosol sources and their seasonal and inter interannual viability may have quite well. Uh, we have characterized a large spectrum of optical properties uh, because there is a lot of variation in size distribution, absorption, aging. That's with what we've seen in the previous presentation. Uh, and uh, the aerosols in the atmosphere have become more, and more complex as well, especially with the explosion of the organics, uh, which uh, are very different and almost ubiquitous. Uh, they're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, but still, uh, there are big uncertainties on the aerosol relative forcing of climate change uh, because essentially there are three big questions that we need to answer. First, it's not just about aerosols today, it's about the changes in aerosol in the large scale globally uh, since uh, uh, pre industrial, so over the industrial era. Uh, so, what are those changes? Then, what is the sensitivity of, uh, of radiation and clouds to those changes? And finally, over what fraction of the globe uh, is the forcing uh, exerted? And those three questions are difficult to answer uh, in their own right, and uh, so the uncertainty um, uh, is, is large because there are all those uh, three questions with large uncertainties. So starting with the pre-industrial reference state, 
so in in a review paper that uh, on aerosol allergy forcing that uh, that we that we published with uh, 30 colleagues uh, uh, three years ago we estimated that the increase in aerosol optical depth since 1850 uh, is likely so that's 68 uh, percent confidence uh, uh, between 15 and 30 percent then you see that's uh, that's quite a, quite a large interval here uh, and that has led uh, through the Tumi effect uh, in, uh, to an increase in plant droplet number concentration by 5 to 17 uh, percent. But there are many things that, uh, that, that, uh, that we don't know that could affect those, those numbers. For example, what did human activities do to mineral dust? Uh, we changed land use. Uh, in some, some cases, that has increased mineral dust emissions. In some cases, that has decreased them, for example, when uh, irrigation is used. Uh, but also climate has changed and uh, uh, mineral dust emissions have changed in response to, uh, to the climate. Sometimes vegetation benefits from the increased CO2, sometimes there's uh, limiting water. A big question on biogenic aerosols. Uh, how much, uh, how much biogenic aerosol was emitted uh, in forests in the pre-industrial? Well, is, is a difficult question to, to answer. And now they are interacting, uh, interacting with anthropogenic aerosols. How has it changed by that interaction? And finally, there's a big question about wildfire. Do, do we increase wildfires by, uh, by adding more sources of ignition? Or do we suppress wildfire by uh, sending the firemen to, uh, to, uh, to put them out, which didn't happen in the industry? Um, here, there is some, some study using uh, paleoproxies. That's a figure on, on, on the right. Oops, sorry. A figure on the right that shows, uh, that shows uh, a, a charcoal record um, uh, and globally, also it's mostly, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, high latitudes or mid latitudes. Uh, and you see that there is, uh, there is uh, suggestions that uh, maybe the, the level of uh, biogenic uh, bio, uh, biomass burning activity was, uh, was perhaps not that different uh, from, uh, from what it is now in the pre-industry. Then there's the complexity about sensitivity uh, of, uh, of radiation uh, to the change in, uh, in aerosol over the industrial era. So we've seen uh, already that uh, uh, for aerosol radiation interactions, the ability of aerosol to interact with radiation depends on their properties or optic optical depth and single scattering albedo, but it also depends on environmental factors. So the surface reflectance uh, 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 under the aerosol, uh, whether there are clouds above that would mask the forcing or below that can change the sign of the forcing, and also uh, the importance of the solar zenith angle. Here on the right is, uh, is the satellite image that shows uh, a wildfire in, in Portugal. So you see the fires are indicated in, in red with the, with the plume being transported to the, to, to the northwest here. Uh, and you see, if you look at uh, this, uh, the, the ocean here, uh, the, the plume has increased, uh, the effective of albedo of, uh, of the scene. So the aerosol uh, in, uh, increase uh, um, uh, uh, solar, uh, solar radiation uh, scattered back to space, so that's a negative reality forcing here. But now if you look uh, over that cloud, uh, which is bright, they are now the same aerosol, the same smoke, uh, is now looking darker. So here you have, uh, you are exerting a positive reality force, and to get a global number you need to kind of um, and consider all those situations. On a global average we find that anthropogenic aerosols have a sensitivity of between minus 20 to minus 27 watt per square meter per unit optical depth. But of course, that will, this is where that will vary strongly uh, regionally. Adjustments uh, to aerosol radiation interactions. Uh, so there are uh, uh, plenty of, um, of uncertainties there, but we now uh, have climate models that uh, that uh, those adjustments are, are, are negative, uh, so they oppose the positive reality forcing due to absorption, uh, which kind of uh, uh, mitigates a little bit the impact of uncertainties. Uh, and in addition, we, 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 there are suggestions that uh, to impact uh, the evolution of clouds, the absorbing aerosols uh, need to be uh, need to be located fairly uh, fairly close to the cloud. Here you see the change in liquid water path for stratocumulus cloud, 
uh, in response to, to a, a, an aerosol layer uh, of a few hundred meters above the cloud, and you see that this response is strong when the aerosol layer is just above the cloud, where it can uh, impact the uh, inversion, uh, temperature inversion, but it's much weaker when the aerosols are, are, are further away. Moving on to aerosol cloud interactions. So there are many, many, many now there is much evidence for, um, for, uh, for so that the Tumi effect uh, happens in the atmosphere. So there's no question there. But the question of quantifi quantifying the sensitivity of top of atmosphere radiation to a change in cloud droplet number is, uh, is, is much more challenging. Um, here is a, is a study uh, for, by, uh, by Dan McCoy in, in 2017. Uh, where you see that uh, in, in model here in reanalysis, uh, the sensitivity is, is fairly low, but when you compare to, uh, to, to aircraft measurements, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sensitivity is much higher. And satellite measurements uh, have sensitivities which are also on the low side. So here there is a difference which is not completely uh, well understood uh, between, uh, between the different ways to look at this uh, sensitivity. Uh, and that's a cause of, uh, of, of, of a large uncertainty in aerosol cloud interaction relative forcing. Adjustments to aerosol cloud uh, interactions. So here we're talking of how liquid water content responds to the change in cloud droplet number concentration. Um, and here the challenge is to separate the impact of aerosols from natural viability in cloud properties. You just need to look at, uh, uh, at the sky to see that clouds are extremely variable uh, naturally. Uh, and so uh, looking at an impact of aerosol is, uh, is, is difficult. But uh, it's, be, it's been done uh, using uh, different methods. One, uh, as Thanos mentioned, is looking at uh, pollution tracks. This, this is an example here. This is the city of Moscow in, in Russia. Uh, this is in the infrared, so uh, a cloud with a small, uh, smaller droplets look brighter. And you see those, those tracks those, uh, uh, which are formed by the presence of the cities and the aerosols that are emitted by the cities. Same thing here, you've got uh, a white fire in, in Siberia. Uh, uh, and you see, you can see the impact of those wildfires, even though they are hidden uh, under the, the cloud cover. If you, if you look in the infrared, you can see because the cloud now have smaller droplets. And here is an example in Canada with a, with a nickel smelter, the just one factory, uh, which uh, is changing the cloud downwind. And so those, uh, those uh, cases are interesting because they allow you to make in plume out of plume comparison. Uh, and assuming that the meteorology doesn't change too much between the, 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 the cloud that is affected by the local pollution source and, uh, and the natural cloud. And when you do this, which has been done, uh, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in this paper by, uh, by Veletol, um, and you look at, uh, at many thousands of those tracks, you find that uh, in some cases, yes, um, the, uh, the cloud here, in this case, the cloud optical depth, uh, which is related to its uh, water content, uh, has decreased a lot. In some cases, the cloud optical depth has increased a lot because it's been perturbed by the aerosol. But you see that on average, on the data set, the, uh, the, the, uh, re uh, the response in cloud optical depth that you get is, uh, is what you expect from the, the Tumi effect alone. So, so, so no change in, in cloud liquid water content. So of course, there is a lot of variability, so it will depend a, a lot on, on the sampling. So there's a lot of discussion. Uh, some, so some recent papers, for example, say that you have to be careful because uh, those tracks may be the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cloud response is not complete, or because uh, the track is visible means that we are in specific uh, meteorological conditions. That's for uh, aerosol uh, water content, but there could be also a large scale response in, uh, response in, in cloud fraction. Uh, and here, uh, the fact that there could be a, a very sizable response in cloud fraction is, is still open. Uh, and uh, studies suggest that it could easily double or triple uh, the instantaneous relative forcing for aerosol cloud interactions. Um, Looking in, in model is, is, is a bit difficult because precipitation is difficult to do. And of course, in, in cloud regimes that, that are uh, 
driven by precipitation uh, that, that poses a, a problem. In addition, the time dependence of the response is, is, is unclear and, uh, and uh, often uh, the satellites that are used only have one image per day, uh, so you don't have the full picture. Ice clouds, uh, I mentioned at the start that uh, they, uh, they are, they are, they are uh, very uncertain, uh, and that's because uh, there are many ideas of how can aerosol can affect ice clouds, but many uh, uh, of those ideas are untested. And, um, and the RIT forcing depends on the ba balance uh, between homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation in ice cloud, which is, uh, which is itself poorly known. Uh, there is some evidence, though, uh, this is a paper that's, that shows uh, lightning, uh, lightning strikes. Uh, this, is, uh, this is in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, this is uh, Singapore here, uh, and you see that the lightning strike shows those, uh, those linear lines which look intriguingly like the emissions from shipping, uh, for aerosol emissions from shipping. So there is maybe uh, uh, a suggestion here that uh, shipping may impact uh, uh, deep convective clouds. So where is uh, aerosol relative uh, forcing from aerosol cloud interaction exerted? Here is a distribution of liquid cloud, but of course you don't get a forcing from every single cloud because, as I said, you need that cloud to be perturbed, you need that cloud to be sensitive to the perturbation, and you also need uh, 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 adjustments. And when you look at this requirement, you find that for the Tumi effect, uh, the clouds that are most sensitive are essentially stratocumulus decks that you will find uh, off, uh, off the shores where there is uh, upwelling. Um, for adjustments in liquid water, uh, this is again stratocumulus uh, that, uh, that, that appear uh, to be especially sensitive. But for cloud fraction adjustment, because stratocumulus decks, sorry, uh, always uh, uh, already have uh, quite high cloud fraction, you will find the sensitivity more to, to, to their edges, uh, but also in, uh, in storm tracks uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in frontal clouds. So if you put uh, everything together, um, that's what we did in, in a review paper a few years ago, uh, and you, you put all the physical understanding to, to, to get a, a distribution uh, of, uh, of the probability of, uh, of different values of relative forcing, and you get this black line here, um, and, uh, and you find, um, uh, uh, sorry, you get the, the, the blue line here, and you find that essentially you can't exclude very, very negative relative forcing because our physical understanding is not good enough uh, to, 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 to constrain our relative forcing well enough. But there are other lines of evidence. Uh, we know that uh, RIT forcing cannot, cannot be extremely negative because otherwise we wouldn't have global warming. But we know also that uh, RIT forcing cannot be positive, otherwise uh, it would be inconsistent with observed surface RIT flux changes. And when you put uh, all this together, uh, this is a, a, a very interesting study that Johannes Quas published uh, last year, uh, you can kind of convince yourself that, uh, yes, uh, the changes in our soil due to improvement in air quality, uh, because of health considerations, uh, have uh, done something to aerosol relative forcing. And there are several lines of evidence. If you look at aerosol emissions, you see uh, uh, in green here negative trends, so decreases in, uh, in aerosol emissions over many regions, the exception being, uh, being India, uh, as was uh, uh, discussed uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, you see that trend in, in, in uh, satellite aerosolical depth. You see the MISER instrument, but other instruments show uh, similar trends. You see that trend is in also in cloud properties. This is cloud droplet number also from satellite, and you see that uh, cloud droplet number um, is decreasing uh, uh, where uh, emissions are decreasing and uh, vice versa. But you can also go all the way to, uh, to, 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 uh, to radiation, and if you look at uh, satellite product of radiation, you see also uh, similar trends. Of course, they are much more complicated because the clouds have changed as well in response to climate change, but you can, uh, you can extract a, a, a consistent signal. And climate models also, uh, also produce, uh, uh, produce something uh, uh, which is consistent with that. 
So we estimate that the, uh, over uh, the past 20, 20 years or so, um, the aerosol, uh, uh, aerosol effective ionic forcing has become less negative by 0.3 to uh, 0.1 to 0.3 watts, which has had its uh, 15 to 50% to the increase in CO2 uh, ERF over the same period. So uh, the decrease in aerosol is now um, feeding uh, global warming. Just to finish, um, I talked mostly about uh, relative forcing, but once you change the distribution of, uh, of energy, of radiation in the atmosphere, there are many things that, that can change. And um, the, uh, the impact of uh, aerosols uh, have, been, have been seen in many aspects of the Earth system. So um, evapotranspiration of plants, the extent of the tropical belt, even coral growth uh, as a, uh, through, uh, through uh, fertilization, uh, as, uh, as Tan was discussed, uh, vegetation growth through the nature of, uh, of, uh, of the um, radiation. So radiation is more diffuse when, uh, when, when, when the atmosphere is polluted. Uh, real, 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 uh, river runoff, uh, the Atlantic uh, multidic schedule oscillation, the Asian monsoon, etc. And then there's also the question of, uh, of natural aerosol feedbacks. So when sea ice melts, you open the ocean for uh, uh, sea spray generation. There's a change in, uh, in, uh, in, in forest cover for organics and uh, mineral dust, and also uh, wildfires, which are obviously uh, uh, a big issue. Um, so I'll, uh, I, will, uh, I will stop there and, uh, and uh, let you read this slide, which is essentially how uh, are we making progress? How, how, how are we making uh, decreasing uncertainties in, um, uh, in, in relative forcing uh, in the future? And essentially, we need uh, models that better represent the relevant scales uh, and uh, observations, maybe based on those strong aerosol trends, uh, but also on, uh, on those uh, co-variation with temperature and relative flux. So I will uh, stop there and take any questions. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank, thank you, you Nicolas, uh, for your presentation. Uh, maybe it's, since you are the final speaker, maybe I can uh, take the opportunity to make uh, a more general question based on your last slide. Uh, this uh, issue about aerosol it seems to be something like uh, LR9 and Hydra. I mean, the, you, cut, you cut some heads, but more are coming out. I mean, you are, we are trying to. Uh, to reduce the uncertainties, to increase the physical knowledge, but then the complexities are, uh, uh, more complexities are, are found, and, and it's going like this. So, uh, and you also propose the way to decrease uncertainties in your last the slides. I mean, I would like to have your comment on this. Uh, <laughs> where are we going with uh, aerosol effect on, on the climate? I mean... So, yes, the uncertainty has essentially remained constant over the past 30 years. I think if you look at the, uh, uh, the different uh, IPCC assessment reports, and if you look at the uncertainty on the aerosolality forcing, it's, uh, it's about the same. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, we've made a great progress in understanding where that uncertainty comes from, um, and in separating the sources of uncertainties which may be irreducible. So things that it's very difficult to know better, for example, what was the pre-industrial preference state with aerosols? I mean, it's not observed. We have very few lines of evidence. So it's probably, it would be surprising if we make great progress uh, on this. Um, but then there are things uh, on the mechanistic level uh, for example, aerosol cloud interactions, where we can hope uh, for progress because we now understand that uh, we need models at the relevant scales uh, and, and we have those models. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, larger dissimulations, we, we, we've, got, uh, we've got cloud resolving models. And we also have an increasing uh, uh, number of observations from, uh, from aircraft, from in situ, uh, that are better targeted at uh, those mechanisms. So we know, we know where to look. Um, and, uh, and so there's, 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 hope. there's hope. But the problem is, is very difficult. And of course, the world is not waiting for us. Uh, the aerosols are changing. Uh, 
we are now in a transition between uh, between uh, anthropogenic uh, uh, aerosols and something different. We are not going back to pre-industrial, but uh, we're we going to some kind of third world, uh, and uh, and we need to uh, to accompany that transition and uh, and document it, observe it, and model it. Thank you, Midas. <laughs> Is it have anything additional to, to ask Nicolas? Well, the two, the last two presentations opened a lot of uh, a lot of questions, uh, very just questions. I think, yeah. Uh, so I think it's better to leave it like this and everybody to try to think about uh, some of these questions and try to deal with them. And, and uh, first, I would like to thank our, our speakers for uh, joining us together and provide such a highly uh, updated knowledge. Actually, the state of the art on uh, on, matter of, uh, on a matter of subjects. And uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, thank for the technical support uh, and your participation here, Stelios. Please. You have the last work. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the organization uh, and impression. And uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. That, uh, uh, yeah, also this interesting talks. And uh, thanks a lot also to the EO for Geo Alliance, the Copernicus Academy, and the project uh, methodology of art of digital properties that gathered uh, all the people here this morning to talk about all this interesting stuff. So thank you very much, Andreas, and everybody. Great. Bye-bye, all. See you. Hi, Julian. Thank you so much. Good evening to for the family. Yeah, yeah, bye. So, αυτό ήταν. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ήσασταν εδώ. Τα στολοφορήσαμε αρκετέ ώρε, η αλήθεια είναι. Αλλά εντάξει, α είσαι και εγώ φοιτητή και α είχα κάτι τέτοιο να δω. Να είστε καλά, καλό Σαββατοκύριακο. Θα τα πούμε είτε τώρα είτε στο μάθημα μετά. Στα μαθήματα. Στα μαθήματα μετά ενώ που θα έρθουν. Έχουμε πολλά να πούμε τι άλλε.